I need I need my tech. Where's my tech? Good morning. Yes, it is. Good morning. Very good. Thank you. Mexico. Everything. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames and messieurs. Um, I would ask that you all take your seats uh, after you've grabbed your coffee and your uh, refreshments. I am Catherine Al Young, Regional uh, Atlantic Regional Director and Senior Trade Commissioner for Global Affairs Canada, and I have the pleasure of being your Master of Ceremonies for today's proceedings. Welcome to the inaugural CETA Expanding Your Business Horizons Forum. This is the very first event of this series which is being launched across the country, starting right here in Atlantic Canada in Halifax, with sessions in Moncton, Charlottetown, and St. John's to follow during the course of this week. These events are taking place under the auspices of the Atlantic Trade and Investment Growth Strategy. And I would like to acknowledge and thank the core partners who have collaborated with Global Affairs Canada to make this forum a reality. In particular, Nova Scotia Business Inc. and the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. You'll also have an opportunity to hear from and speak with representatives later today from the Business Development Bank of Canada, Export Development Canada, Canadian Commercial Corporation, and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And now for a couple of housekeeping details. As you will have noticed uh, in the outline of the agenda in your information kits in front of you, we have a rather full program today. And you may have noticed we actually have not programmed in any breaks, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that you can't take them. I encourage you to help yourself throughout the morning at your convenience to refreshments in the foyer, which are just outside this room, which will be continually replenished. And for those of you who need it, washrooms are down the long hallway to the left of the interlude spa. If you have not yet done so, I would ask that you turn your cell phones to vibrate mode as a courtesy to our speakers and panelists. I also encourage you to tweet during the forum and some hashtags you can use is hashtag CETA and hashtag CanadaEU. This forum is being webcast and la recorded. Thus, during the Q&A segments, I would ask that you kindly use the two roving microphones. If you have a question, that you kindly use the two roving microphones that two of my colleagues will have, and you'll be able to see them because they'll be standing up here in the room. A number of you have pre-arranged one-on-one meetings just after lunch with the senior trade commissioners from our post in the European Union who are here with us today and on one of the panels very shortly. Those of you who do have these meetings will have received confirmation and these will be taking place in the Atlantic Room which is right out the door next door. For, you, for those of you who did not request a one-on-one -on -one meeting but would like to do so now, there are still a couple of slots left uh, that are available. Please see my colleague Alex La La um, Lantern at the registration desk, and he can slot you into any of the openings. 
And I would like to remind you, that just after lunch, there will be an export cafe where you will be able to speak individually with almost all of today's speakers and panelists. The cafe will take place right next door, again in the Atlantic Room. And last but not least, in your kits, you have an event survey. Kindly complete the survey before the end of lunch. Your comments will greatly, greatly help us with future sessions about to launch across Canada. And also let us know if and how any of us that you see today can be of further assistance to you in your exporting efforts. So without further ado, I would like to invite Laura Broughton to the podium to make a few remarks and introduce the event's business champion speaker. Ms. Broughton is well known to many of you as she is the president and CEO of Nova Scotia Business Inc., NSBI. Laurel was appointed to a position in January of 2015. She is a former Bay Street lawyer, Ontario cabinet minister, and is a public policy expert and advocate with a keen focus on growing the economy in Nova Scotia. Ladies and gentlemen, Laurel Broughton. Thanks, Kathy, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of NSBI this morning, and I just want to acknowledge uh, I have a lot of colleagues in the room, so if I can get everybody from NSBI to put your hand up, throughout the day you'll know who to go ask questions to. There we go. See, if you don't think that we care about CETA, this room proves the, the point differently. So again, welcome everyone, uh, and to our Nova Scotia businesses who are working hard to ensure a better Nova Scotia for everyone, thank you for taking the time to be here today, and welcome to the forum. As Kathy says, today we are going to talk about opportunities arising from the Canadian-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. More importantly, we're going to talk about the tools and knowledge to help you realize these opportunities. Today, you will get a chance to learn from the experts who will be sharing critical information that helps Nova Scotia businesses and the province benefit from the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. I think we'll call it CETA for short. We only have so much time throughout the day. NSVI is delighted to host this forum along with our partners, Global Affairs Canada, Export Development Canada, Business Development Canada, Canadian Commercial Cooperation, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. One of the things that I have learned in the last uh, five years that I've been privileged to call Nova Scotia home is that in Nova Scotia, we work very well together. Uh, it's an example where all hands are on deck to make sure that we see our businesses succeed, and today is no different. All of us are pleased to be able to present today's forum and others like it to help Nova Scotia businesses prepare for doing business in the European market. We understand and appreciate the complexities of doing business overseas, but more importantly, we understand the benefits of exporting, increased productivity, faster growth, higher revenue, in other words, stronger, more successful businesses. Exporting is a key factor in growing our economy. As a province, we are producing goods and services in demand across the globe. We are excelling in sectors like technology, seafood, agri-food and beverage and professional services. And these are all reasons we have sessions like today. To help Nova Scotia businesses not only start exporting, but find success in exporting. As a province, our prosperity is driven by businesses that have the understanding and confidence to expand into new markets. Our job is to lay the groundwork that helps you make those connections, understand the opportunities, and access the tools and resources. Over the past year, we've hosted other CETA sessions, such as selling to the European Union and understanding the CE mark for exporters. I promise you that every person who attended these sessions will enter the expert market better prepared, connected, and confident. This is good for business, and it's good for Nova Scotia. We are an economy that must diversify, and we must think big from the start. The European market is half a billion customers. With CETA, 98% of the tariff lines are eliminated with Canadian companies having access to government procurement markets at all levels. EU national, regional, local, and utilities. This is a $3.3 trillion a year market, the largest in the world. We now have unprecedented access to this market, but it's not just about access. It's also about labor mobility and knowing there is a strong climate of wanting to work together. This is the European Union 
Union telling us that they will do what it takes to support your exporting efforts. And our ties are already very close. In 2016, Atlantic Canada exported more than $2.7 billion worth of merchandise to the European Union. Nova Scotia specifically exported $405 million. That makes the European Union the second largest export market after the United States. And trust me, we are leveraging the opportunity. NSBI is leading several trade missions to the European Union. Some of those include a taste of devour in Berlin, Oceanology International London, and Pro Wine in Dusseldorf. I encourage you to visit the NSBI website to learn more about our trade missions and reach out directly to members of our regional business development executive or anyone on our export development team, many of whom are here in the room today. They are waiting to hear your stories and answer your questions. Please take advantage and register, as Kathy said, for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the EU experts who are available to discuss market approaches and opportunities specific to your company in the Export Cafe. Firms from all regions of Nova Scotia join us on trade missions to grow their export markets. One of those companies is Victoria Cooperative Fisheries Limited, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Osborne Burke. Mr. Burke is General Manager of Victoria Co-op Fisheries. Osborne is here to share with you his specific experiences on doing business in the European Union. Osborne has been a champion of the Nova Scotia seafood industry for more than 40 years. From crewing fishing vessels to captaining his own, Osborne has managed his own enterprise and has been an executive member of a number of different fishery and seafood organizations. For the past eight years, Osborne has worked for Victoria Cooperative Fisheries Limited as general manager. He passionately believes in the strengths of his local cooperative movement and the sustainable fisheries that support our coastal communities. Osborne is a strong advocate for sourcing new opportunities for value-added products, a key driver for increasing exports and growing sustainability. He is also focused on looking beyond the traditional U.S. market to Asia and the European Union, which brings us full circle to why we are here today, to understand and take advantages of the opportunities presented by CETA. Please join me in welcoming Osborne Bork. Not often the guy gets to, you know, to operate this, so I'll do great. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Anyway, good morning to everybody. Uh, glad to be here to offer a few comments and uh, no great expertise. I've been called lots of things over the years, but never champion, so uh, thank you, Laurel, for that. Um, basically, yeah, we have the slide up there, good. Anyway, we're, uh, I'm General Manager of Victoria Co-op Fisheries. We recently celebrated 60 years in business, and not many co-ops have lasted as long as we have. It's uh, you know, the dedication of the members and the board of directors, which changes frequently every few years, but uh, they've, uh, over the years, when in years we've had profits, they've invested back into the business and went from strictly taking local control where they couldn't, uh, they were dependent on merchants coming in and buying back in the late 50s and to the point where they started up their own operation and went from a live operation just selling their fish to into processing and as ground fish closed in the early 90s and they went into shellfish uh, very uh, quickly in, in uh, both lobster and snow crab but I'll click ahead there we go anyway we're established in 55 incorporated in 56 Generally, we have a 10-member board of directors who are all fishermen. It's 100% owned by the, the harvesters. We've got about 127 members, and we're spread in northern Cape Breton, if anyone knows, from Inganish right north to Basin Lawrence. So there's seven harbors over that stretch of area. And we also buy from some non-members as well. And we've got about 140-plus employees in the peak season. Uh, a number of them are seasonal, and an annual payroll of over $3 million into the County Victoria, which is we are the largest employer, even more than National Park or anybody else. So it's significant and the money is staying in the community. We do have a fully operational lobster holding facility. We hold about 300,000 pounds. And to put in perspective, this year, past year, 
In two months, we purchased 1,752,000 pounds of lobsters. In two months, there was a lot of handling of lobster. Processing facility, we also, besides processing lobster, we usually process about 3 million pounds of snow crab. And that's bought from our members on both sides of the, the areas of both the Gulf region and the uh, Nova Scotia region. And a couple of million pounds because we also purchase lobster in the fall season from southwest Nova Scotia. We have our own trucking company. The reason that was done was to meet the customer's needs. When you're dealing with live lobster and you have to get into uh, Boston in a hurry or you get a call on a Sunday night and you need the lobsters tomorrow night. So it's to respond to the needs of the customer. And we do have our own trucking company. We not only haul our seafood out, but, and as far as Texas, but we also, with frozen product, we also then carry freight back around the loop to Toronto and then back to Nova Scotia. So we have five full-time drivers at that all the time. And we've got to work closely, like I say, we're, we're focused on quality, quality, quality. Price will come, but if you've got the quality and you've got, we're starting out with a hell of an advantage in Canada and Nova Scotia in particular with very excellent seafood and it's well known worldwide. So that makes it a little bit easier. And then we focus on the quality. It's in, it's processed within 24 hours for ship. And that's critical. We'll, we will generally pick up a better price per pound than others will because people, once they get used to the product, want the Victoria brand product. And that's where quality is critical. Uh, CETA and the European Union, I mean, ongoing discussions were underway when we first began to look at European market a little closer when I first came on. And we, we did what we could in looking up online and gathering research, gathering information, checking with agencies such as I've said here, NSBI. I think I've got it on the right one, have I, Laura? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries, Agriculture, Agri-Foods, ACOA, who some of the people are in the room here today, uh, trade commissioners, and uh, gathered everything we could about European market and what the potential was. And then over the past, this will be year four, we've gone to trade shows, Germany, Amsterdam, Austria, Brussels. Um, the executive uh, MBA program that ACOA is involved with at St. Mary's, we also in the past, this is year two, we've supported a couple of people going over and worked with the students to, uh, to uh, rec you know, represent the Victoria Co-op at various shows as well and at all, has paid dividends in the long term. And it's an ongoing learning experience. Uh, meeting with the companies at the trade shows is critical, and the, the critical thing as well, besides the quality, is building those relationships. And as somebody already said, CETA has been in effect since the middle of February, and 2017. And prior to CETA taking effect, tariffs was about 25% uh, were tariff-free, and now we're at 98%. And it's created an obvious opportunity for Canadian seafood industry. And it's a plus 511 million people, so it's a hell of a potential market. And they are seafood eaters as such. And uh, there's real opportunities there. And when we first entered it, we quickly learned it wasn't as simple as selling our products in their current format to the EU. For example, snow crab is the 30 pound brine sections in a box, ship off to the US, easy to ship to Asia. Yeah, they'll accept that. But in Europe, they're not a big eater of snow crab sections necessarily, maybe some larger size. So you're looking at maybe snow crab meat, maybe it's in four ounce packs. Packaging is different, probably uh, typically at least four languages on it. So there are differences in it. And uh, I think we quickly learned that you just can't push on the customer what you've already got. You've got to speak with them, find out what they're looking for, and then adapt to what they need. And that make a successful operation. Um, and even within the EU, uh, we shipped, we've shipped to the Netherlands, we've shipped to Austria. Different again when you're dealing with customs people and product lands at the airport. It's a learning curve for us every time we get in with, involved with a new customer in a different country in the EU. Not everybody interprets the rules the same. And you get a different customs inspector, surprise, surprise, you got a glitch and your product is held up. Something as simple as putting your documents on top of one of the boxes versus inside. If you ship, the logistics people want it inside, found out the hard way. Gets there, they won't let them use a copy to get in to get the originals. <laughs> so 
you quickly learn to get through it and, and understand what they want in each one of the areas. And I don't know which one, yes. Um, and we're trying to build a business, as I said, one customer at a time. And uh, we're looking at the first time ever getting into retail and developing different types of packaging that the customer is looking for. And we're doing, looking to focus more on value added because there's a lot of product that leaves Nova Scotia in its initial format. Live lobster is never going to change. But there's also real opportunity here. We've got probably 20 plus million pounds of live lobster leaving in the fall season and going to New Brunswick and other provinces for processing. It's good for Canada, but if we can keep more of that here in Nova Scotia and in our rural areas and generate additional employment, that's our focus as well and better overall profits. And uh, I don't know if I'm at the end or not, I am. So as quick as I can try to get through that and keep on time so I won't be in trouble, uh, that's, that's about what I have as an update. We're going to keep plugging away at it and keep can going we, over. Can we convince you to, t thank you for that, and yep. can we convince you to take some questions? Sure. Just uh, You know, share I'm a your person of few learned. words. I know, I know. <laughs> And you don't travel much. Your passport has no stamps in it because I've seen you in every airport around the world. Yeah. If you come to China on February 24th, I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I know that there's some mics at the yep. back of the room, and I'm sure folks want to just uh, ask for your advice and learn your lessons. And if there's no questions, even better. Oh, <laughs> darn. Uh, good morning, Joe Lewis, uh, Scotia Coast Seafoods. Uh, Mr. Burke, do you see any issues arising? I, I hear you say you got 20 million pounds of lobster being shipped out of province for processing. Uh, the provincial government has recently put a freeze on uh, the fish buyers and fish processing licenses, as you know, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, what benefit do you see to this freeze and revamp of the uh, licensing program? do you see and which uh, negative effects do you see in terms of new business uh, locally within Nova Scotia? Thank you. Well, uh, being one of the individuals and as president of Nova Scotia Seafood Alliance as well as a Victoria Co-op Fisheries uh, as an employee, we've lobbied the past year, we and other organizations for the minister to do just what he did. First of all, we want to revamp the policy and he's, he's un that's underway. In the interim, we wanted to put a freeze in there to avoid a mad rush on getting licenses. But if you look at, uh, it's very similar to the harvesters where I used to be, it was, it's limited entry. It's significantly increased their value over time. So if you've got facilities like ours and others throughout the province that are in these rural communities, generating a lot of employment and putting millions of dollars in there, and how do you go to the bank and invest more and do more value added when 50 more people could operate, open up and operate when we have an overcapacity as it is in certain species in Nova Scotia. Snow crab being an example. We've got enough capacity in Nova Scotia to process double what's coming in. So it doesn't make any good business sense for the government or anybody to do that. Uh, harvesters have raised the concern, well, they're going to you know, control it, that they won't get the price. Well, as long as there's two, I said in an interview the other day with Paul Withers, as long as there's two buyers in Nova Scotia breathing, they're going to get the best price. 2017 was an example where we overpaid over and above the market and lost millions of dollars through Nova Scotia, not on the harvester side, but on the processing. Um, the current license, people may not understand, there's over several hundred lobster buying licenses. Each one of those licenses can designate another hundred buyers. It's, it's something that needs to change as well. Currently, we have designated 17 buyers. The reason for that, we have seven harbors. Everyone who picks and handles the lobster for us, our employees, have to be designated as a buyer. So there's no fear of anything from that respect. Uh, at the same time, if there's opportunities in Nova Scotia, what we've asked for is to put some sort of a review committee in. So if we want a permanent freeze. Whatever licenses Victoria Co-op has, that's what you got. However, if somebody would want to get into doing a particular product and they're not licensed for it, then they would make a good business case and make the request to the provincial fisheries. Um, a couple of examples right now, there's a moratorium on ground fish. Under the current licensing policy, if you're a company that has no ground fish license but you want to bring ground fish in from Newfoundland where the northern cod's increasing, which would benefit Nova Scotia, you can't do it legally because 
cottage under moratorium in Nova Scotia, but it means you can't process, you can't get a license at all, which makes no sense. Uh, Silver Hake is another one where it spoils quickly. There's a number of companies that would want to start doing some potential freezing of some additional stock other than what they ship to Europe fresh now, which only goes to Spain. Uh, they can't because it's a ground fish species. It's under moratorium. It's not under moratorium, but ground fish licenses are under moratorium in Nova Scotia. So there's a lot of those little glitches there that need to be corrected. There's no process for a lot of aging seafood company owners to uh, hand off their business to family, succession planning. They can't do that under the current system. So this is the whole concept behind trying to change the policy. It won't be perfect, but at some point in time, it'll be better than what's there now. And we want the initial freeze, but we want it long going because there's more than enough licenses there. But still allow a mechanism for uh, opportunities to come, because I think at the end of the day, we all want to uh, support anyone in Nova Scotia in doing additional business, employing more people. Uh, Laurel mentioned uh, Nova Scotia working together. Just go to any one of the trade shows, Shindao, the big one, uh, Brussels. Nova Scotia booth is about, it's an open booth, 10, 12 kiosks. We got competitors side by side, and if I'm not there and somebody comes looking for me, they're going to take the information or, or work together. Go look at the other provinces. They're all in 10 by 10 cubicles, totally separated from each other. We're one big team in Nova Scotia, and it's working well. But anyway, that was a long answer to your question. <laughs> See, I don't say much. <laughs> Hopefully that's answered it. Can you maybe talk about um, the importance of being in markets? So you say you've yeah. shows. Yes, and, and for a little company like ours, as, uh, as I would say again, without the assistance of whether it's Export Growth Program or any of the funding programs through a COA or Nova Scotia Fisheries or whatever, if not, we couldn't be there in the first place and we're all getting together and sharing boot space. But it's critical that you're in the market. It's one thing to do the research, but you, you know, and it's great by all the technology, but nothing beats sitting down with the customer at the table, in the booth, having a face-to-face chat, getting to know them, because relationships, as I say, is critical. We're now three to four times to China, and got into the, gotten to the point now with China, Hong Kong. Uh, the customer of Hong Kong is now flying to Dalian to meet me while I'm there. Uh, you build those relationships. When you get invited into China, into the customer's home with their family to have dinner, you're making progress. And that's critical at all, at all those. They like to sit down and, and, and chat, chat. And in our case, other than the sales force of one, we've hired on another gal who formerly is from China, went to NSCC in Cape Breton, and she's now six months over there and six months here. And what a world of difference it's made into Asia having somebody that knows the culture, knows the people, and to sit down and can speak the language when you're sitting with the customers. And that's another investment we've made And anyone. Uh, there's a number of Nova Scotia seafood companies now that have gone the same route, whether they've hired a translator or somebody from over there. It makes the world a difference if you're going to be in that market. And the same thing in, in Europe. You've got to take the time, sit and meet with the people. And that's important, right? We've had calls from, we're dealing with a customer now in Singapore, that they want us to come over there. And so you're just going to go and schedule your trip and make it because that's what they appreciate, right? You're giving that personal attention to them. So it's critical to be in the trade shows and in the booths. Right. Whether you're in the booth initially, you're walking it the first year, then in the booth another year, uh, you've got to take the time to do that if you want to be in the business. OK, good. I've escaped. <laughs> Nicole, the remote is here. Thank you very much, Mr. Burke. For those of you who have not yet exported to Europe, you've gotten a sense that we have a bit of an expert here. So you, I would encourage you to call on him. You know who he is now, and you can see from his experience what he's done. Um, and now, for those of you who have not yet exported, we have a little uh, overview. So it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker to you. He's a longtime colleague in the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service, Sanjeev Chowdhury. He is currently the Director of the Free Trade Agreements Promotion Task Force in Global Affairs Canada. 
He was our Consul General in Rio de Janeiro from 2011 to last year, uh, 2017. During the course of his career, Sanjeev has also served abroad as our Consul General in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and in Mumbai, India, as our Acting High Commissioner in Sri Lanka and the Acting Ambassador to the Maldives. He has also been the Deputy Chief of Protocol for our department and has served as the Director in the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister and in the Office Office of the Minister of Finance. Sanjeev is a native son of Nova Scotia, having been born and raised right here in Halifax. Please join me in welcoming back to Canada's Ocean Playground, Sanjeev Chowdhury. Good morning, everybody. As a native Haligonian, I arrived here, and he's already starting to laugh because he knows what I do when I arrive at the Halifax International Airport. I commandeered a car with my right-hand guy here, Jordan. Where are you, Jordan? He's right back there from Calgary, Alberta. Jordan and I arrived on Friday and went straight to King of Donair <laughs> and then to the hotel. So uh, we are, uh, I wanted to introduce Jordan to the delicacy, the official food of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I can honestly say I had nothing to do with the fact that the mayor of uh, Halifax broke the tie when that motion came to city council to make the donair the official food of Halifax, even though he did stay with me in Rio de Janeiro, and I was trying to indoctrinate him the entire 24 hours he was there to support the donair. At any rate, uh, it's great to be back uh, in Nova Scotia, and we are going to give you a quick overview of um, <clears throat> the uh, Canada-Europe uh, trade agreement. A lot of people think CETA, C-E-T-A, they think the C-E stands for Canada-Europe, but it doesn't. It actually, the Canada-European Union part comes before CETA, so it's the Canada-EU CETA. CETA stands for Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. I learned this after um, three months on the job, that uh, <laughs> the C-E doesn't stand for Canada-Europe. Okay, here we go. Jordan, let's start. Are you mic'd up? Oh. That's Kathy. I'm not Kathy, although we are often mistaken one for the other. He's going to he's going to get this. We we've only practiced this for hours yesterday, so Sorry, we uh Here we, we go. We had a couple title cards for our, our Which we never partners, used. Okay, that's me. Now that's we're in the him. right now we're in the right area. Let's go. Okay, so we just have a few slides here. We're just going to give you a quick overview of CETA and then uh as I uh, I mentioned to many people and if you've read any of the blogs or the interviews that we've done, this particular road trip which is going to Halifax today, Moncton tomorrow, Charlottetown Wednesday and St. John's on uh Friday is what I'm calling the Rolls Royce of the uh, CETA roadshows. We have people here with us from Global Affairs Canada, former members of Global Affairs Canada, that are, um, have all been invited by me. I'm standing right behind one of our most famous former um, employees of Global Affairs. This is David Plunkett, who was our ambassador to the European Union until last year, was it? Okay, well, well, we wish it was until last year, but 2015. David's here. Uh, he's going to moderate a panel in a few minutes. We've asked him to come back for uh, a trip. Josie Mousseau is here, my dear friend. She's in charge of uh, Global Affairs Canada Business Women in Trade Program. Claude, are you over there? Did I see you? There's Claude Dagenet. He's actually from New Brunswick, but he works at Global Affairs Canada. He's uh, in charge of the Indigenous Business uh, Group at Global Affairs Canada. We've got our four st senior trade commissioners from Europe who are in the panel right after this, who you're going to meet. So we've brought in the, um, the who's who of, of people from Global Affairs Canada for this event today, and why? Because before CETA, 25% of tariff lines, as Osborne noted on his slide, 25% of the tariff lines were duty-free. On September 21st, uh, the agreement actually kicked in. Osborne had on his slide February 2017, but it was actually September. I hope you didn't ship anything over between February and September, because you're gonna be getting a bill for it later. But September 21st, 98% of stuff, uh, tariff lines went to zero including live lobster. So um, it's quite an, inc it's, a, it's an incredible uh, jump. And uh, we're gonna have another 1% um, go down to zero over the next seven years. It's being phased in slowly. So it will be 99% of tariff lines that are going in. 
to um, Europe that will be tariff-free. Um, we have just this slide we wanted to show you. We're, we've got one for every province. Uh, what are the benefits for Nova Scotia? Um, we've done a, a little bit of research, uh, as Laurel mentioned, about the, uh, the amount of money from Nova Scotia, the, uh, the, the merchandise exports. Uh, we, luckily, we have the same number, $442 million in 2016. Um, we're very particular to make sure that all of our numbers match because you, sometimes we see presentations and people have three different numbers throughout, but we've, we've vetted all of this with the Office of the Chief Economist in Ottawa. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea. Obviously, the, the biggest one there is fish and seafood, and that's why I'm standing behind this wonderful woman here, our Senior Trade Commissioner in Brussels at the European Union, Michelle Cooper, who is on a panel with me. Is that you, Michelle? It is you. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I, uh, um, she's on a, a panel right after this, but she's also in the Export Cafe. She's our fish and seafood expert. Uh, we brought her in from Brussels for this Atlantic tour because uh, we figured that it would be of interest to many people in this room. So she is one of the four that you're going to see in a few minutes um, from, uh, from Europe that we've flown in. She just got here yesterday, poor thing. She's jet lagged, but she, she missed her connecting flight in Montreal, but she still found time to attend the lobster dinner that I organized last night at Salty's. She managed to arrive five minutes before the dinner, and as a true champion, she ate that entire lobster roll in 30 minutes or less. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so uh, what's, uh, okay, well, I guess this is the same thing as last time, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that's uh, now duty-free. Um, keep going, Jordan, let's move. Um, so Laurel mentioned a lot of this in her, um, in her remarks, but I guess the, um, the one thing that I always tell people is that there are five kind of key, key parts of this agreement. Uh, you know, no, no free trade agreement is simple. So you know you got to read it, you got to kind of study it, you got to you got to kind of use it um, to learn it. But if I had to highlight the five kind of key areas of CETA that uh, are going to be of great great advantage to um, Canadians, it's the fact that as Laurel mentioned, we have access to public procurement for the first time. It's a 3.3 trillion dollar government procurement market in Europe. That's at the federal, provincial, and municipal level. They also have access to our government market here, which, you know, some people say, well, what's so great about that? I say, well, what's great about that is that it encourages competition and some municipalities, provinces, uh, federal government, we can actually save money if, if bids come in from Europe that are cheaper, but it's both ways. So we have access now to public procurement. Number two, streamline customs and trade facilitation. You heard Osborne talking about some of the idiosyncrasies of, of, of exporting to Europe. It's true, every country does have slightly different requirements. Uh, there are 28 countries in the EU, so you have to keep that in mind. But um, we have uh, streamlined that, um, that uh, and we're going to get into that a little later on. Um, tariff elimination on the top there, you know, we saw it's 98%, going to 99 over the next seven years. Clear rules of origin. Uh, rules of origin are never easy to understand, but um, if you read through the chapter, which we're going to show you in a second, you have to read it. You got to understand it, but you can actually. Um, uh, there are many ways to to determine rules of origin even before you export. We're going to talk about that a little later, but you can actually do an advanced ruling uh, with your importer in the EU to make sure that your product does meet the rule of origin um, requirement. So that's something called a BOI, binding origin information. You can apply in advance. So if you're not sure if your product is going to actually meet the requirements, if you still don't understand the rules of origin after reading the chapter, you can apply. It takes about five months right now. That's the maximum for the EU to render a decision, but you don't have to take any risk. You can apply in advance, make sure you meet all the requirements, and then ship your products over. So that's something really neat. And then the last thing, of course, is enhanced labor mobility, which uh, Ambassador Plunkett and uh, Pascal Kernis, Pascal, is he here yet? There he is. Uh, we've brought Pascal Kernis from the European Services Forum. He just raised his hand here. We brought him also over from Brussels. He arrived yesterday, and, and Ambassador Plunkett, and he, and he will be doing a panel, uh, and two, two panels from now up here on the stage, and they're also at the Export Cafe, and they're going to touch a little bit more on labor mobility. Um, this is um, the most important slide in my presentation, and I'm coming to the end now. I just want to run through for you guys how important this website is. This is a website at the bottom, you see there, international.gc.ca slash CETA. That's the Global Affairs Canada website about this agreement. We have put a lot of money, a lot of research into this site. We've tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. I'm going to click on this link now, or Jordan is going to click on it, and we're going to just show you a couple things on here because um, we want... Oh, yeah, hold there for one second, uh, Jordan, sorry. Are those... Um, here we go. Yeah, perfect. So this is um, uh, our page, our landing page for CETA. That's the international.gc.ca. 
uh, webpage. That picture there on the top right is our trade minister, Minister for International Trade, Francois Philippe Champagne. And uh, there's a little video there that you can, uh, you can uh, listen to. Um, it's only two and a half minutes long, so the minister introduces uh, CETA to the Canadian public. But basically, this, um, this website is split into more or less three uh, areas. Okay, stop right there, Jordan. What does CETA mean for Canadian companies? Uh, what does CETA mean for foreign investors and the EU for you? We're going to start on the top there. What does CETA mean for Canadian companies? Go on the right there, um, Jordan, learn about CETA. Um, this is uh, just, um, I wanted to show you this particular uh, part of the website. Uh, over here, we have the agreement overview, the final text of the agreement. If you're suffering from insomnia, you can read any of those too. But can you click on the chapter summaries there, uh, Jordan? On chapter summaries, we have, a, a, frankly, a chapter summary. So we have summaries of all the different chapters. The ones that people mostly like to read first before they go into the main agreement to get all the details is chapter, you don't have to click on this, uh, Jordan, but just show them chapter two, protocol one. So that's the uh, rules of origin and origin procedures. And then chapter 10, uh, temporary entry and stay of natural persons for business purposes. Again, we're going to have Ambassador Plunkett and Pascal talk a little bit about that later on. But this is the chapter summaries. I find them a lot easier to kind of browse through the first time before you go into the actual agreement agreement. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so that's the chapter summaries. If we go down to the next section here, uh, go down. Oh, go back one, yeah, go back one, sorry. Yeah. So uh, over here, the EU for you, we have something called the Canada Tariff Finder. We're going to click on that and give you a quick example of how that works. If you want to know what uh, your current tariff is on your product that you may be shipping over to, um, to Europe, this is uh, a tool that we have developed with the BDC and the EDC. Uh, we've put a, spent a lot of money on this. Is it perfect? No, it's far from perfect. But it's the best tool we've got and it works pretty well. Um, we're updating it, the three of us, the EDC, BDC, and, and GAC, Global Affairs Canada, we're updating it this year, um, and that will happen in March, but we wanted to just show you how, how, it is, how easy it is to use. Click there on Get Started. So you go to the Canada Tariff Finder, you click here, and um, it, there, it's just three steps, one, two, three. The first step's already done for you, so you're exporting. You can pick a country. Let's pick, um, what country should we pick, Jordan? How about France? Okay, let's pick France. This is, all, this is all rehearsed, everybody. We've, all re we've rehearsed this. It's all fake. Okay, and <laughs> let's pick a product, Jordan. What should we pick? Uh, how about telephones? Very good. Okay, so there we go. We tried to find one easy last night on the website that would be, that would be easy to find. So we type in France, we type in telephones, hit find. So um, there we go. Look, so it will list all the different um, products that come up when you type in telephones that you want to export to France. If you click on the first line there, let's see, it says line, telephone, Line telephone sets with cordless handsets. It's broken down further into line telephone sets, blah, blah. So if you click on that, you'll see what your tariff is. Go down, 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 and the tariff is zero. Wow. So isn't that great? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I told him not to sound so fake, but I don't think he, uh, <laughs> I don't think he's, uh, well, he is, free, well, yeah, he has actually produced theater productions, but he's, uh, he actually hasn't started any, and that's all pretty obvious. At any rate, um, so 0% <laughs> all across, you can see what your, your tariff rate is. This tariff finder tool doesn't only cover the 28 countries in Europe, it also covers some of our other free trade agreement countries. I think we've got, um, um, uh, what, is that, what is it? Korea, Can uh, Canada, Korea, and I think we have... Um, Ukraine? Ukraine, yeah. I was going to say Ukraine, but I wasn't sure. Thank you, Jordan. Canada, Ukraine, Canada, Korea. Um, we have some of our other trade agreements in here, and we're looking to update uh, others uh, so that you... Canada actually has 13 free trade agreements. You may not be aware of that, but we have 13. It will soon be 14 when we join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP that the minister announced we would be signing in, in March, and uh, that'll take another year, year and a half for it to be ratified, but we will soon have 14 agreements. But uh, we have 13 right now. But this one covers the Canada tariff finder covers three as far as I know for the time being so this tariff finder you got to go in here you got to play with it you got to try different names for products blah blah if you know your HS code you can just type in your HS code here and it's even easier it's faster but we just wanted to give you an example of how um, the Canada tariff finder works okay let's go back to the website I don't know what this is. He's, he's got all these screwed up here let's go back to the website there we go go back I want to show them the um, the, the icons at the bottom, the six round icons. 
Go back. There we go. Go down a bit. Okay. So and then this thing is the last part here is called the toolkit. The toolkit. So this is all on the same page. Okay. So you've seen um, the chapter summaries. You've seen the Canada Tariff Finder, and now you see this toolkit. So we've got six icons here. We're not gonna. I'm just gonna click on one, but I just want to show you top right exporting to the EU a guide for Canadian businesses. Don't click on it. I just want to show them that this is one of the few guides that we get so many comments about, positive comments about. It really is a step-by-step -step guide for anybody that wants to export to the EU. A lot of work has gone into this guide. We're going to update it in a couple, uh, in about a year or so. It's, it's, it's great. So if you have not exported to the EU, or even if you are, this is a guide that you should read. Um, then right below that icon is called the CETA Promotion Toolkit. I love this uh, icon. I probably love it because I added it after I... I started, so it's mine. Let's click on there. See the promotion toolkit in here. Um, I just want to show you guys um, uh, that we have here um, basically. If you click on the CETA benefits fact sheets by province and region, just click on there, Jordan. We're not going to click on any, but what we did was we, this is all new. We put this all up for September 21st when the agreement came into effect. We have uh, gone and, and done a research uh, project on every province. On some provinces, we have more than one listing because it's, it's larger. Nova Scotia's got its own entry there. Uh, and, and what we've done is we've, we've done a little bit of research on as to which province um, what, what, what we think are your, your, your best uh, bets for exporting to, uh, to Europe, where your, your greatest strengths are. Next to that, uh, we have something called CETA benefits by sector. I just want to click on that drop down. Yeah. So we've chosen also, Global Affairs Canada has chosen 12 sectors that we think have the greatest promise for, uh, again, exporting to the EU. And we've got a couple pager on, on uh, for example, I noticed the, for some of the, the export cafe appointments later on that we've got some companies from the fish and seafood sector, from ICT, et cetera, et cetera. This is a great place to go just to see. Uh, it's a two, three pager on each of these sectors, uh, 12. It doesn't mean that these are the only sectors, of course, that are um, whole promise for Canada EU trade, but it's the 12 that we kind of highlight uh, as having the greatest um, potential for, uh, for us to, uh, to export to the EU. Um, so let's go back, uh, Jordan. So this is basically um, the, the, you just go back up to the top. This is basically the, uh, the, uh, the landing page with our minister there uh, kicking it off. Can you just go down into the, the middle part for one second, Jordan, slowly, slowly. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you this also, this last uh, part here, again on the main page, the EU for you. If you click on that middle one there, Jordan, the EU's markets, right next to the Terra Finder. This is um, a great little summary. It's a two to three page summary of every country in the EU, what their, you know, their economy, their population, what their strengths are, where we see the greatest um, opportunities. Uh, a great, great place to go and read if you want to, if you're, particularly if you're pinpointing a specific country that you want to export to, uh, all updated. And um, as you know, we have uh, four senior trade commissioners, as I mentioned, who are about to join me on stage. And in fact, while I wrap up, I'd like to ask Michelle, John, Samina, and Greg to please, and Francis, where is Francis? You're there. Francis uh, from Global Affairs Canada, I'd like to ask you guys to make your way back here to the corner where this gentleman is standing up. He's going to mic you up for the, next, uh, for the next session. So while I take some questions from the crowd, if you guys could slowly make your way there, uh, it'll save some time. He's going to, and don't say anything bad about me because the mics are live. So um, you, can, uh, you can get... You can get mic'd up while we're uh, while we're uh, taking some questions. So that's a bit of an overview, gang, of the um, of the agreement. And um, I'm happy if there are any questions. Why we kill uh, six minutes for the next panel to start with our four senior trade commissioners and, and Francis Dorsamain, who is um, from Global Affairs Canada, from the European Bilateral Relations and uh, Advocacy Division. We're all going to make our way up there in a second, and we are going to. Uh, take your questions. We have a question here from Fred McDonald. Fred. Uh, you've told us what the 98% um, uh, represents. What does the 2% that aren't covered represent? Um, it's actually, um, the 2% uh, that is not covered are certain, for example, it's, it's interesting. We, we were talking about this last night. 98% is uh, tariff-free as of September 21st. Another 1% will be phased in over the next seven years. I'll give you an example of what that 1% might be. Um, so for example, live lobster uh, dropped to zero on September 21st, the tariff. I think it was 
Is that right? Yeah, I think it was 8%. Um, I have so many tariff numbers in my head. Thank you. So um, frozen lobster is being phased in slowly over the next seven years. It didn't go to zero on um, September 21st. And some of the products that have been chosen uh, to be phased in over a period of time are products which um, have a greater um, impact on the competitive um, on competition with, with European firms. So what we're trying to do is uh, slowly phase that in to give people an opportunity to get used to the fact that this will at one, uh, one day become zero. So it wasn't an immediate overnight shock that it would go down to zero. So it's, it's sometimes in areas like that. Um, and the other 1% that will never come down to zero are in protected, um, uh, more sensitive uh, areas where we have decided that they will not be subject to tariff elimination. So uh, it depends on, uh, it could be defense products or, or, or an area where there's a national interest. Okay, Sanjeev, any other questions? Sir? I have a question over here. Hi, has Canada's elimination of its tariffs on European goods come into force yet? Did you read that question? Are you a student? Yes. I can tell. <laughs> Where are you student? Where at? Uh, Halifax Grammar School. Oh, that's great, great. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I used to do some work at the grammar school many years ago because I went to St. Mary's. Where's Boris? Boris, are you here, Mirchev? Boris is here. Boris, I saw him come in this morning. He and I went to St. Mary's together 28 years ago. Um, I was in student politics, and Boris told me he voted for me. But I remember at the last seminar that I was at, Boris was there, and I heard him telling my competitor who showed up that he voted for her. So I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what's true, but I'm going to find out later. Anyway, um, what was your question again? Uh, has Canada's elimination of its tariffs on European goods come into force yet? Yeah, so on, that's a great question, on, and, uh, and it's an easy one for me, so thank you for asking it. Um, on September 21st, um, uh, we went from 25% to 98% overnight. So, um, yes, it has uh, come into effect, and now we are looking at phasing in the, uh, the next 1% over the next seven years. Some of that will happen faster. When you go to the Canada Tariff Finder and you look for your product, you saw when we just showed you telephones to France, you saw that um, it was it dropped to zero right away on um, September 21st. But you will see if, if your particular product is not yet at zero, um, you will see in the, in the Canada Tariff Finder, when you look at the graph below, you'll see what it's, how it's going down over the next five to seven years. If it's like, for example, 12%, then going to 10, 8, Six, blah, blah, blah. You'll see what that is depending on what your product is. Okay, so you can check it out there. The other way, same. Yeah, the other way, yeah, you meant the other way too? Yes, yeah, so it happened both, both ways. 98% uh, in both directions. And in fact, that if you stick around for lunch, if you're going to have a, a free lunch courtesy of NSBI, you will be able to meet the EU ambassador to Canada, uh, Ambassador Ustubes, who's going to be here, and he's going to be talking um, to the crowd. Uh, and uh, that would be a very good question to ask him as well, because uh, we want to make sure that that 98% both ways stays into uh, effect uh, and that we don't have any hiccups along the way. And so far, so good. Okay, any other questions before we... Yes. Wait. I don't know if it's a stupid question. Oh, I'm going to whisper there... it first. <laughs> How does Brexit affect the world? No, that's a very good question. I think you should ask that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask into the mic for the people live streaming. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a stupid question. Uh, it's, there's um, never a stupid question, and I just hope well, I can answer it, or, or Jordan's we, we in big trouble. We don't know each other yet. Jordan's uh, in big trouble. How does Brexit affect the agreement? Okay, so Brexit, um, uh, Greg Houlihan, where are you, Greg? Oh, Greg's over there. Greg's our senior trade commissioner from the UK. He's going to be joining us on the panel in, uh, in a few minutes. In fact, I can ask you guys, that you can make your way up to the stage, um, uh, Francis and gang, and I'll, uh, I'll join you in a minute. Greg will, will get a, into that a little bit more, but I can tell you right now, the UK is a full member still of the EU. Uh, the uh, CETA applies to the UK. Um, the UK has indicated, I've learned all this from Greg because this is our second road trip together. Um, the UK has indicated that they plan to ratify the agreement before they, they leave Brexit. Uh, they, they, the, before Brexit, it gets triggered. Um, and Greg can talk a little bit more about the impact uh, on the EU um, withdrawing from uh, the, uh, not in the UK, sorry, withdrawing from the EU. But for the time being, the EU, uh, the UK is a full member of the EU and the agreement applies to the UK just as it would to any of the other 27 countries in the EU. Somebody over here had a question? Yeah, let's go here and then we will start our next panel. Yeah, on your toolkit, does it break so down we? Uh, each country per machinery where it might have the greatest chances of okay. selling equipment there? So. No, it doesn't. It doesn't break it down by uh, machinery. It gives an overview of the country. Um, so you mean like specific in terms of like if you went to, like for example, if you go to one of those 28 countries, Bulgaria is one of them. If you click on there, do you mean like on that? 
Right, right. right. But, uh, if I knew that, I would target them. Yeah. I think you'll find, I mean, I've read quite a few of those uh, two, three pages on the countries, and there's a pretty good bit of information there. And then if you need anything further specifically on it, we can go to uh, uh, Francis's group in uh, Global Affairs Canada. They do European uh, Union bilateral relations and advocacy. You can get more information from them. Um, so, yeah, I think give it a, a shot. I, uh, I'm not sure of the answer to your question. I just remember reading some of them, and I, I don't think it's split up that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know what also would work for you might be the tariff finder. Um, so if you type in, for example, the product that you want to export and you pick a country, you can see what those are. But we can uh, we can try to figure out. I'm not really sure, but I think, uh, and, and maybe, yeah, okay. And, and then maybe Ambassador Plunkett can give you some more information. Okay, Kathy, we're ready to go? All right, we're going to start the next panel now, and I'm moderating it, so I will make my way. Okay, perfect. So um, I, am I introducing the panel, or are you? I am? Am I? <laughs> now, are you jazzed or what? <laughs> oh, what a great shoe, huh? In both official languages, too. Um, moving on to something that you've all been waiting for, my colleagues from Europe and from Global Affairs Canada, our Europe experts. But before we do that, I have the pleasure of welcoming Karl Schmeiser. He's NSBI's Director of Export Development. And he's going to actually introduce you to, to this phenomenal group of people uh, so you'll know who's who, and then Sanji's going to moderate the panel. Now, for those of you on this side of the room, I know this is not great, and it would have been nice if it was a transparent one, but you'll be able to hear them, and then you'll be able to meet them this afternoon. So, um, and I think uh, you'll be able to know who's who when they're speaking. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in response to your uh, question, we uh, at NSBI, we have a, a product called Trademark and Intelligence, TMI, where we actually do research. Actually, and the, the yeah, person, yeah, Colleen is at your table, so she'd love to talk to you about it. We do market research for companies, primary research. So that might be a product that would, uh, or service that would, would benefit you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy, uh, I, I think we've been off to a really good start this morning with uh, both uh, Osborne's comments and with Sanjeev, uh, uh, give us a bit of overview on CETA. So I'm now looking forward to starting the panel session, uh, the first panel session of the morning. And the first panel session is uh, doing business in the EU, marketing opportunities for Canadian businesses. Sanjeev, who we just met, is going to moderate the panel. Uh, I am going to introduce you to the other speakers that we have uh, uh, joining us up on the stage. I'm not going to give full bios for everyone, everyone just in the essence of keeping us on, uh, on schedule, but we do have bios in the packages uh, on your tables. So uh, the first uh, expert that we have up here is Francis Dorseman, and he is the Deputy Director, Commercial, European Bilateral Relations and Advocacy Division, Global Affairs Canada. And then we have Samina Qureshi, who is a Senior Trade Commissioner within the Trade Commissioner Service in The Hague and Counselor within the Embassy of Canada to the Netherlands. Uh, next we have Greg Houlihan who is the Minister, Councillor, and Senior Trade Commissioner at the High Commission of Canada in London. And then we have John Roxborough, who, who is the Senior Trade Commissioner, Trade Commissioner Service, Dublin Embassy of Canada to Ireland. And finally, Michelle Cooper, who is the Councillor and Head of Section for Agriculture, Fisheries, and Environment, Mission of Canada to the European Union in Brussels. So I'll leave you with Sanjeev, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from everybody on the panel. Thanks, Kyle. Okay, so um, like I said, we flew in. Uh, not, Francis came from Ottawa. He's also suffering from jet lag. He's one hour. <laughs> he's, he's had, he, and I can tell you, uh, Kyle, nobody, I've never heard anybody say anything nice about Francis except you, calling him an expert. So that's great. Um, <laughs> Francis and I have been posted together in India. We've worked together since... 2004. 2004. So we invited him down, um, and he is um, very special to me. He's driving my van from Halifax to Moncton. I trust him with my life. <laughs> we have four vans. We're hitting the road today to drive to Moncton, and Francis is driving me. Um, he's also driving Michelle and uh, Ambassador Plunkett. So we're, we've all split up. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll skip the snow before it starts. Um, but the others have all flown in from Europe. They all arrived uh, yesterday. And uh, we've invested a lot of money to bring these guys here. We want you to take full advantage of the fact that they're present. Um, somebody did ask me a very quick question out in the hall. I, 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 it's a very simple question. There are no stupid questions here today. They asked me, what is a high commission uh, versus an embassy? And Greg 
uh, is from the U uh, Canadian High Commission in England. I just wanted to tell you, a High Commission is an embassy. It's just that we call any, um, if, if, if you're a member of the Commonwealth and you're in a Commonwealth country, you're uh, at a High Commission and the ambassador is called High Commissioner. Uh, for example, uh, Canada is a member of the Commonwealth, of course the UK, so that's the High Commission. But uh, Canada is a member of the Commonwealth. In the US, the US is not a member of the Commonwealth, so our ambassador to uh, the US is called ambassador. So that's the only difference, um, uh, and, and we call it a, a High Commission. So that's, um, all of these guys are senior trade commissioners from uh, these four different missions in Europe and they're going to talk to you a little bit. They're going to give you a, a seven to 10 minute overview of their, their country, their market, their area of expertise, and then at the end we're going to take questions. But we're going to start off with Francis, who's from, the, um, from Ottawa, from our headquarters there. He's going to give you an, a little overview about, uh, about his division, about the European Union in general, and, uh, and then we'll, we're going to start in the order of Michelle Cooper first, um, and then we're going to have Greg, is that right? And then we're going to have uh, John and then Samina at the end, okay? So we're going to uh, go in that order. Francis, over to you. So I think that's working. Yeah. I'm going to stand up if that's uh, easier. That way you guys from this side of the room can see me. You might not want to actually see me afterwards, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Oh, look at that. I love this. Lots of technology. This is really, it is the Rolls Royce of our troop. <laughs> um, so as they mentioned, as uh, Sanjeev mentioned, uh, my name is Francis Dorsamain. I'm a deputy director and uh, trade commissioner based out of Ottawa. I work sort of on the back end, the back office with our uh, trade commissioners here uh, in the field. We work on strategy. We answer questions. We get involved in some more complex export questions and uh, coordinate with the various teams. As you heard, we've got people from different sections from all over global affairs. Uh, but most importantly, I'm, uh, I'm a trade commissioner through and through, um, and it's a job that I love doing. Um, so quick question, how many of you know what the trade commissioner service is? And maybe show of hands, how many of you have worked with the trade commissioner service? Hopeful, we're gonna capture the rest of you by the end of the day. <laughs> Um, so just a quick summary there, the TCS or Trade Commissioner Service, it's the largest Canadian network of international business professionals around the world. We are everywhere you do business. Um, we're going to give you a lot of information here today. Um, the thing to take away, and especially from my little talk, is we are there to answer your questions. When I say I'm with the government, I'm here to help, I actually mean it. Um, so we are in market to help you jumpstart your entry. We're here to try and lower some of your costs, answer your questions. We give you a lot of online resources, but we're also there in the market, building a network so you can actually jump in there, meet the people that we have uh, carefully curated for you to, to meet. Now, the EU market has always offered, let's see, thanks, George. <laughs> Uh, EU markets always offered a lot of opportunities for Canadian businesses. Uh, what CETA has done is open that up even more. It's given us this massive tariff advantage, which is really very important in the context of some of our big competitors like the US who are going into Europe, they're doing a lot of business. We now have this advantage and we've got a window of opportunity ahead of the US getting in, which means that we want to encourage you to grow uh, the numbers, grow your exports. So we heard earlier in terms of uh, 442 million uh, from Nova Scotia going into Europe, 2.7 billion from Atlantic Canada going into Europe. We've got over 100 billion in exports going from Canada and merchandise trade into Europe and over 40, uh, 40 billion in uh, uh, services as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, and what I'm here to talk about is that, yes, we have CETA, it is a sort of a facilitating vehicle uh, but we've also got to think about the EU as sort of not just one market. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to go in, but you are still dealing with 28 markets. Um, so I think we can probably go through. So the EU operates on the basis of a single market. They set the rules, regulations, entry conditions, which makes it a lot easier for you to go through. But it's still quite a complex system. Uh, but the big, big advantage that's there is that that's the harmonization of those rules and regulations across market. Now, within the borders, if we, oop, we go back here, so you've got a single market, incredibly diverse, 28 major member states, 23 official languages, and 19 of which use the euro. So what I want you to take away here is that 
while you're going into a, uh, into a larger uh, single market, you also need to uh, tailor your product to the individual markets that you're going into. And this is something Osborne touched on earlier. Um, so you've got to think about languages, you've got to think about labeling, you've got to think about how your product is going to be uh, received in that market. And in some cases, looking at the currency issues as well. Uh, there are some several regional, sub-regional differences within the EU in terms of regulations, market dynamics, economic trends, uh, which provides companies with a diversity of opportunities, but also some challenges. Uh, a good example is in terms of Northern Europe, Benelux, Ireland. You've got some low barriers to trade and investment, but really very interesting B2B market. If you go to Germany and Eastern Europe, you've got strongly integrated value chains. You've got some great, uh, great quality products to build on, um, and it sets some really ideal conditions to invest in as well. I keep going over here instead of there. So some of the things to think about uh, that are non-CETA factors to trade, and I'm going to throw out the concepts here, uh, but as Sanjeev went through, there's a lot of this information that you can do some research um, in terms of our CETA website. Uh, you can find some of this stuff on the Trade Commissioner website as well. Uh, but you can also pick up the phone or send an email to one of our uh, Trade Commissioner colleagues that are in the field. Uh, so certification and labeling, we've got a number of different tools that you can have a look at and uh, I believe Michelle will touch on some of this, uh, but Blue Guide on implementation of the EU product rules is one of the areas that I really do recommend that you go in before looking at exporting into the market. Uh, so you have our resources that are from the Canadian government and the provincial government, but we're also very lucky in that the EU is also very keen to have these imports come in. Uh, and they have developed a lot of different products which will give you some guides to uh, going through. And I suspect my colleagues from the uh, EU will also talk about their fantastic tool which is their trade help desk. And that can answer a lot of questions for you before you go in. So in terms of certification, um, I'll just touch a couple of uh, main points here. But prior to exporting into the EU, you really do need to be uh, familiar with the relevant certification standards for the products not just at the EU level, but on the member state level as well, um, as some of these can be uh, different. Certification requirements also uh, apply to uh, the importation of certain food products uh, and may require appropriate sanitary certificates. This is something you can pull from uh, CFIA. You can get in touch with our trade commissioners on the ground, and Michelle has a wealth of knowledge on this area as well as her team. Um, in terms of labeling, it's like exporting anywhere. You've got to find out what the labeling requirements are when you're going into the market. You can talk to your importer, you can speak to us, and this is a recurring theme. We're the Trade Commissioner Service. We're here to help you, so ask those questions. That's what we get paid to do, and that's what we get measured on as well. So it's very important to come and reach out to us. A lot of different product labels exist in the EU. You've got them at the EU level, national level, some are mandatory, some are voluntary, some are environmental, energy, food labels. There's a wide variety and I'm not gonna spend more time going into that. Um, but I do encourage you, again, speak to the TC, speak to your EU uh, importer and have a look at some of our online uh, uh, tools. Uh, VAT, value-added tax, is another concept uh, that people need to be aware of and where you pay it. Uh, this is effectively the GST and HST. Uh, you still have to pay it and it varies based on the different uh, member state as well. Uh, the last piece on this slide is CE marking. Now, first, if you're exporting into uh, with uh, chemical products, cosmetics, foodstuff, pharmaceuticals, you don't necessarily need to deal with the CE marking, but again, this is why it's important to speak to your trade commissioner. Uh, now, this is a certification mark that indicates conformity with health, safety, and environmental protection uh, standards. It's very important, and it allows you to then go throughout the uh, European economic area. So once you've got it once, you can get it through the entire market. So if you've gone into, let's say, Belgium, you can then export that product into other different country markets throughout the European Union. So this is where the EU superstructure really does add an advantage to you as you get into the markets. Now the last, my next slide here deals with general data protection regulation and I was asked to speak to this because it does actually affect when you are collecting uh, information from individuals within the European Union. 
This is very important for those that are selling services, digital services across, um, and it's a rule that applies both to companies that are established in the EU, uh, but also companies that are in Canada who will be collecting in pri private and confidential information from EU citizens. What this does really is it it's used to strengthen and unify data protection. So it's, it's a new uh, system that's going to go into place uh, May 25th uh, of this year, and it'll be applicable across the entire uh, EU um, immediately as a regulation and not a directive. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the differences on those either. Um, what this does, it really does simplify the regulatory environment for international businesses but it really strengthens that protection for individuals in the, United, in the uh, uh, European Union. It gives rights to individuals in terms of consenting for data collection, similar to what we have in Canada. A right to be forgotten, so there is a requirement to delete the information that's uh, collected, uh, and that's something that an individual can come to you for. Um, it establishes data protection officers, compliance, risk assessments. There's uh, rules that uh, pertain to notification of data breaches within 72 hours of a, a data breach. Um, and there are some, uh, there, there's, uh, there's some penalties for not sort of following these rules. So this is one piece that if you are getting involved uh, with selling into the, into the EU, uh, where you are collecting private information about your, your customers, about your clients, you do need to be aware of this, and this is something you can become uh, familiar with before you start your exporting, and I very much recommend that you do it. I think, go so one last slide. So if you've noticed a recurring theme, come and talk to us. This is where we are. We are everywhere you do business in the EU. Uh, it's not just a single market, it's 28 markets, and this is a huge opportunity for you. Um, if you're trying to find a market, uh, you can pick and choose. You can find markets that are uh, very competitive, very advanced, but you can also deal with markets within the EU that are also still at an emerging market say, uh, uh, size. So there's something for everyone. Um, and this is something that we can help you do is to determine where that market is that's the best fit for your product, best fit for your company. Uh, as a trade commissioner in the field, I give advice and say, yes, come to my market. I often also say, no, this is not the market for you. Um, and I get uh, my metrics uh, go with that as well, so it works. I can say yes or I can say no, it's fantastic. Um, and so what I really want to uh, suggest and focus on here, I've got four colleagues that are going to come and speak to very specific markets that they are responsible for, and they can do deep dives into sectors uh, that would be interesting for each of you, market entry strategies, um, and if you have any other questions in terms of sort of general EU or market specific, I'm happy to speak with you later. Thank you very much. Can you ask question as well? <coughs> we have sold machines to Europe, and we have to certify Mm -hmm. When they sell to us, are they going to have? Are they going to have a CE mark or a, a different machine without the CE mark that they're going to be marketing in Canada? Uh, so we have, as I understand, it, or Sanjeev, if you've got a. I'm not sure. Will they require a CE mark when it comes to Canada? They don't require it, but are they going to have a, a, a machine that's a little cheaper because they don't have to do radiation testing or magnetic? But there are there are import requirements on both sides, and they are at the same level. So I I'm not sure what mark they will require. I'm worried about a competitor having a machine yeah. that's cheaper that they can sell in Canada, but we have to get the CE mark if we want to sell to them. I'm not. I'll, I'll check into your your question, but I don't know the the, the answer right off the top of they'll, my head. They'll need whatever certification is needed to be present in the Canadian market, Canadian Standards Association, or whatever for that specific product. They won't they won't be able to undercut a Canadian competitor because the Canadian has to get their local certification. So they won't require a CE mark. Well, chances are, if they're selling from Europe, they they will have a CE mark for selling domestically. They of course. It's not it's not just an, an importation rule, but any domestic sales yeah. as well. So. Mm -hmm. And I can mention the, uh, the Standards Council of Canada signed an MOU with their European counterparts so that they can do mutual recognition. So I think maybe, Gray, you're going to touch on that, but it's, it, it's something that's advantageous because you can get certified in one side and then you can go to the other side. So it'll be equal on both equal. sides. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It'll be Thanks. equal. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go on now. Uh, I'm going to ask Michelle to, to come up. Uh, you can sit or, or be at the podium, but I'm going to ask can each I of the STCs, everybody? the Secretary <laughs> Commissioners that are, are presenting, if we can, uh, we're running uh, six minutes.
minutes behind schedule. <laughs> okay. So Sorry. if we can, it's okay. It's not your fault. Can we uh, try Actually, to limit it? Yeah, wherever you, wherever you prefer. You can see the slides here in front. As long as people can see me over yeah, there. We're going to try and, uh, and, yeah. and spend about seven minutes each All right. on our markets, and then we're going to take questions at the end. Okay? Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. And uh, as uh, Sanjeev mentioned, uh, you mentioned the thing about the High Commission. Well, I'm also at a mission. We call it a mission of Canada to the European Union, because the European Union is, of course, not a country. So we do not have embassies. We do have an embassy in Brussels, which is to Belgium and then Luxembourg as well. And my colleague Greg Lutrust isn't here today, but he's our senior trade commissioner. So happy to take questions on Belgium as well and take them back if I can't answer them today. But our mission of Canada, the EU, is mostly because of the common commercial policy and other common policies that are determined at the European Union level, like CETA, of course. Um, so that is why we have a, a mission there, and we work very closely with our counterparts in the Commission, the Council, and many other EU institutions. And particularly on things like policy questions, particularly on sectors that are difficult, like environment, uh, agriculture, fisheries, three areas I look at, it really does matter what goes on at the European Union level. Even though member, individual member states can go down, it is important first with the EU policy that's made at the 28 member states. Nope, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So but today I'm here to talk to you about agri-food and fish and seafood opportunities. Two big sectors I know for Nova Scotia and many in the Atlantic provinces. Uh, Francis mentioned some of the general benefits. You know that it's over 500 million customers. You know it's 20, you know, 20 percent of the world's uh, GDP. It's a big market. Um, but another important thing is it's the world's largest importer of agriculture and agri-food products in the year, in, in the world. So they are a big market. And I just wanted to throw out a couple of the, the figures that I have because they uh, import $163 billion in 2016 figures, uh, which is 16% of the world's uh, total trade. But here's an internal market statistic. It's $694 billion. Dollars uh, is uh, in, uh, traded amongst member states as well. So you get into this, you're talking about trade that's up to almost a trillion dollars uh, going on in agri-food and agriculture trade. So it's a big market. Um, and CETA is, as we mentioned, a competitive advantage over other major agri-food exporters. And it also levels the playing field with some others. So I'll mention, the US has been mentioned many times. Don't know if people saw the New York Times article on Live Lobster. That was out a few, I'm sure a few of you did, um, you know, that it said that Trump's trade policy is working for Canada. Uh, we were happy to see that because it, re, you know, great profile. Uh, and we want to see more uh, people realizing that there is a market advantage for Canadian companies over our competitors. Other major ag agri-food exporters, other ones that you might know of are Mercosur, the Southern Americans, they do not have an FTA. Uh, China does not have an FTA. Southeast Asia does not, uh, so it's a Australia, New Zealand. So we are really on the front of, as a major G7 country, getting in that market. Because tariffs on agri-food in the EU have been historically quite high, much higher than in uh, Canada, as an example, in many areas, particularly on uh, processed foods. So the value added side is where the tariffs are really coming down, and that's where we think they'll be a major. It also levels the playing field in some sectors, such as fish and seafood with Norway, as an example, because I know Norway is a major competitor, and uh, you know, at the Seafood Expo Global, which we have in Brussels every year, we see people coming up and going, wow, now you compete with Norway. So it's not just about uh, getting ahead of people, it's also about getting back into business in some areas. So in terms of numbers, uh, it was mentioned already the 98% figure, but in agri-food, it's 94% eliminated immediately on agri-food, that's as of September 2017. It's 96 on seafood, so that's a very big advantage. But one figure I'm sure is interesting to people is 100% of fish and seafood tariffs will be duty-free at the end of seven years. Not a single tariff will remain going in from Canada into the EU on any fish and seafood products. So that's a huge advantage, so much so that Norway had to renegotiate their agreement, and they're still in the process of doing it to actually try and keep up with us. So good deal, and it's a really good opportunity. Michelle keeps mentioning Norway. I just add, Norway is not part of the EU. It's something I also learned after three months on the job. So I don't know why, and I don't want to get into that now. It's a long story. It's a long story, and I'm, I'm not interested. But Norway, when you hear her referring to Norway, it's also it's one of the few European countries yeah. besides Switzerland, for example, which is a neutral yeah. policy. But it's not part of the EU, in case you're wondering. Yeah, it's part of the e European economic area, but it's not as good a deal in some areas. And that's what they told us. They said, wow, you guys got a better deal than we did in fish and seafood. So that tells you something. Good negotiators, right, David? Yeah. <laughs> and before CETA, one thing I did want to highlight is we only had a 2.1% market share in the EU. It's pretty low. 
Um, and I think the opportunity to grow is really strong. So I think I want to highlight that as well. This we have the slides, so I think you're going to be sending out the presentations because I know it's quite detailed here. But a good example is, you know, the 94% of agriculture lines becoming duty free. There's all kinds of ones in here that I'm sure of interest. I know there's a lot of fruits in uh, Nova Scotia and in the Atlantic provinces. So things like blueberries right down to zero, uh, cranberries down to zero, lots of fresh fruits. We also have wine goes to zero and other beverages. So these are really interesting sectors. Maple syrup, another one that I know uh, is of interest here, also going to zero. So they're all zero. They've all been zero since September 2017. We have a few phase outs that will occur in agri-food because of obviously there's some sensitive products, things like wheat that everybody knows about. And there are going to be some tariff rate quotas, which are quotas for some of the more sensitive sectors. And I'm sure people know in Canada, the dairy is sensitive here. In, in the EU, similarly, in a lot of the meats area, so beef and pork in particular, we agreed to quotas that will be phased in over, the, the I think it's five years for the beef. <coughs> Opportunities, it's all over the market in the EU. I mean, you have, you have some of our senior trade commissioners that will talk about their, uh, their sectors, but you know, we, we deal with, as a network, there is a, a multi-country sector team on agri-food all over the EU that is led by uh, Julie Ferguson Sneedy and our, uh, who pe many people may know who do fish and seafood. She does the fish and seafood side and Yannick Dele in Paris. And they meet and they talk regularly about all the trade shows. So I have a list here if anyone wants of like 20 plus trade shows on agri-food in the EU and in different sectors. Organics is a good example. And uh, also, you know, there are specific opportunities. So as Sanjeev has said, you want to talk in each market, but this is some of the highlights. And one of the things that we are really trying to get people to pay attention to more is the opportunities in the value added and the process side. And when I mentioned organics, uh, bio as they call it in, in Belgium, it's uh, that is a huge area. Gluten-free foods is another area of huge advantages right now. So we've got, uh, you know, they are very sophisticated customers in the EU. They know what they want. Uh, if you can target your market, uh, it'll be a huge advantage for you. And uh, I think, you know, we did talk about the whole fact that there's 28 markets, but sometimes if your product starts to do well in one market, it gets picked up. An example would be France and Belgium because it's the same language. So, it, it, and we've also seen this with the UK and Ireland as an example. So it can, if you get in one market, it can help you open you up. Getting to fish and seafood, as I mentioned, 100% over seven years. There are a few phase outs. You can see on the left side of the slide, those are all now zero. So the live lobsters we mentioned many times, 8% down. Um, shrimp, I know shrimp is another area of great interest. That is not only gone to zero, but there's no more processing requirements because there was an issue in Can where Canadian shrimp had to go to the EU, be processed. Now that's gone. There's no requirements anymore on what you do in order to get zero. There'll be a few phase outs, mostly on more the processed side because that was a sensitive issue for the Europeans. Obviously, they were taking a lot of raw product and processing it inside the European Union, so they were a bit worried about being competitive with us. But, uh, you know, in some cases, like frozen lobster, it'll be three years. And then in 2000, when we're 2020, it'll be duty free. So there's lots of opportunity here. The opportunities, again, we've surveyed all our trade commissioners in the EU across the 28 markets of what are the areas of possible uh, advantages, and they're coming in with all kinds of different uh, areas. It's a, it's a really popular market for fish and seafood right now. They are, they are, the Europeans are major importers of fish and seafood, as we know, and they are looking for good product, high quality product, good price, obviously, that's always there. But uh, you know the tariff advantage will be a big player, I think, for people. So I think these are good areas. There's a couple of two things I want to mention. One is the Seafood Expo Global, which uh, many companies from the Atlantic Canada participated in. That's in April this year, April uh, 23rd to the 25th. So we hope to see many of you there. Uh, it's the world's largest seafood show. And our mission does uh, organizes meetings in conjunction with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. I don't know if agri Agriculture is here today. They are. They are the agriculture here. and agri here. They'll be at the Export okay. Cafe. Yeah, so they help set up the show with us. And we're working on a seafood exporter guide to the EU. So similar to the exporter guide to the EU that's already on the website, we're doing a very specific one just for fish and seafood. And we're hoping to have that ready in time for the Seafood Expo Global. Last thing, I think I'm not going to touch too much on this, but uh, because Francis already did, but there's a lot of market requirements in the EU that you will have to be aware of. As mentioned, a lot of this is about sanitary certificates, things like pesticide residues, if you're, if you're, especially if you're shipping things like fruits and vegetables. There are some pre-product approvals, so come see your trade commissioners, and labeling is another one. 
Um, but I did want to mention one thing for fish, which is obviously there is the need for a catch certificate for wild caught fisheries. That's important. DFO manages that with the European unions, and this is to make sure that fishing is not coming from illegal sources under illegal. And last, just some tips. This is the overall tips, and I'm sure the individual markets can give you uh, highlights for their markets, but it's sustainability is a big word in the EU now. People want to know where their food comes from. Sometimes they want to know not only just is it, does it make me feel good, but it's also is it good for the world too. So I think that's, that's kind of the line we use. And uh, you have to think about things like sustainability. You have to think about uh, if you're going to use pesticides. Those things are important in the U European Union. And they're caring more and more about social issues too. And so you'll see through the retailers in particular, but also through the processors now, they're demanding higher quality certification standards and they're looking for making sure that they can sell that product. People care where their food comes from, I find in Europe. It's a very important thing to them. So consumer tastes, very different though, across different markets, so hence know your market. Talk to the trade commissioners. So there we are. I think we can achieve success, and I think we have a great opportunity. Great, thanks very much, Michelle. We're going to go right into our um, Senior Trade Commissioner from the High Commission of Canada the UK. Thank you, that was great, Michelle. Greg Houlihan, Greg is on his second trip with me. We did a, a trip, uh, a pilot trip in November before we, we rolled out the Rolls Royce of these trips here to Atlantic Canada. So Greg, it's great to have you back. You did such a nice job on the first time around that we had you back again. So <laughs> welcome and over to you. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm based at the High Commission of Canada in London in uh, beautiful Trafalgar Square in fantastically renovated new building, Canada House, but it's a building that's 200 years old. But uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, have the Queen and uh, open the newly renovated Canada House about two years ago, and we were fortunate enough last year to, uh, to host her again. So it's a fantastic spot. And I have about 25 different trade commissioners working on the team, so we're there to handle uh, questions from any, virtually any sector, but today I'm going to look, um, just follow a couple. Um, so why the UK? Well, you know, frankly, everybody has a relative in the UK or a relative here or there. And, I mean, we have a very long-standing tradition, rule of law, democracy, everything is, we're very, very well known to each other. Um, it's a diverse, sophisticated economy. It's home to, I think it's home to uh, many, many, many global firms, something like uh, um, uh, uh, 25 Fortune uh, 500 firms are located, uh, headquartered in, uh, in, in the UK. Um, it's Canada's third largest uh, destination for merchandise. Um, we have a two-way trade valued at about 25, 26 billion dollars, 17 billion in Canadian exports, so it's a, it's a, great, uh, a great market for us. Um, Brexit, I'll talk about a little bit later, but there, there are some opportunities with Brexit. Um, one of the key ones is it's turned the UK into this global Britain. Uh, the UK is really looking for partners and they're looking to do business internationally um, with this, uh, with this uh, new approach. And then more recently, they have a national infrastructure plan. They're planning on investing about 850 billion Canadian dollars over 20 years in a number of different, uh, a number of different sectors. Um, some of the priority sectors for us, um, certainly ICT is a, a priority sector in the UK. Uh, out of uh, six to 700 Canadian firms total based in the UK, almost a fifth or, or so are in the ICT sector. Many of them are small, um, but we also have some big ones as well. Um, telecom, again, there's a lot of infrastructure investment going on. Um, is a big uh, area of opportunity. Internet of Things, um, like connected devices, smart cities, um, and of course we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, buzz around the AI um, and uh, machine machine to machine uh, connectivity as well. And then you have to consider that it's a very very strong startup culture in the UK. There's tech clusters all over the place. Um, with a very active venture capital community, and uh, it also has most of the IPOs in Europe are in the UK. Also, fintech, cybersecurity are big areas, and they're traditionally, of course, uh, um, big growing areas for, for Canadian uh, capabilities as well. Um, the other one, clean tech, uh, priority sector for us. 
Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in the UK, uh, focus on being smarter and um, with flexible tech, um, batteries, and a lot of research and development going on there. Um, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, hydrogen fuel cells, um, lots of things in that area. So there's, there's lots of uh, opportunities for our companies there as well. Offshore renewable technology, um, we're seeing uh, lots of interest, particularly, you know, um, um, I think areas from partnership, uh, certainly in that area, um, because of uh, because of our, uh, our our abilities and and our our companies over here who are who are getting uh, lots of experience in that as well. I'm going to move quickly. Aerospace. Well, I mean, there's a lot to say about aerospace. Um, certainly, it's the largest player in Europe, second in the world after the U.S. Um, Canada is very, very well repre represented. We have a number of uh, aerospace uh, firms, large one like, uh, like Bombardier, who's up in, uh, in Bel Belfast and doing the wings for the C-Series. Um, and we have also, it's extremely, it's a, it's a, the UK is a market with a very high reputation um, and certainly in their expertise in, uh, in engine design and production. Um, They've, the government's launched what they call this aerospace growth plan. So again, more investment in, in that area. And because the UK is such a, a large player with 17% of global market share, there's lots of opportunities um, in the, to access global supply chains there. You've heard a lot about the fish and seafood. Um, again, the UK is actually, I think it's the largest in largest export destination for Canadian seafood in the EU. So um, we see a lot happening there. Um, I can tell you since CETA has come on board, what we're seeing is a, a couple of really good success stories uh, um, where, and I, Michelle has mentioned it earlier as well, where, where sp species that we were not competitive are all of a sudden becoming competitive. Um, and uh, so we're seeing, uh, for example, redfish is the one uh, that, or, or ocean perch, I think it's called as well, that uh, we're seeing uh, some really good stuff um, happening. Again, uh, we, are, we are seen uh, to be uh, a great supplier, and uh, our team in, in the UK is, uh, we, we, we partner and we do a lot of work with, with everybody here in Atlantic Canada. I've done a number of uh, Taste of Atlantic Canada promotions and, and shows and things. So um, again, it's a, it's a very strong market for us. So doing business, why you want to do business in the UK? Well, it's a global hub, as I mentioned, for a range of sectors. The government is pushing an ambitious low carbon um, agenda. Um, demand for products, um, they do have uh, demand for products at lower cost with improved efficiencies. So if you've got innovative products or services, they're early adopters and they will certainly take advantage of that. There are a few challenges. Um, industrial strategy that was just released in November, um, it's really focused on, um, on driving the domestic supply base. But that being said, because they're putting a lot of money associated with this industrial strategy, there are opportunities there. Um, it's expensive. Um, it's expensive to live in the UK. It's expensive to do business. So you have to make sure that uh, you're, you're willing to invest. And the Brexit question continues. I mean, there are some opportunities, but there's still additional uncertainty that uh, we have to follow up on. Um, how can CETA? Well, I think we've seen all of this, the elimination of uh, 98% of tariff lines, um, but for us, this, this enhanced access to the UK public procurement market is, is going to be a big opportunity. Um, for example, um, SNC-Lavalin recently purchased Atkins, a large uh, engineering services firm uh, in the UK, and they're establishing, they're getting themselves ready for, for all of, for both, both ways, um, access to the public procurement market, and specifically when the UK is investing all this money into, into uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, again, CETA gives Canadian firms the advantage, so um, we've heard a lot of this before. Now, on Brexit. 
So nominal withdrawal date, so the, their last day in the EU is, is going to be March 29th, 2019, so basically on March 30th, uh, they're going to be gone. Um, at the moment, um, there's lots of talk about a transition deal, like, which would be two, maybe three years, um, to allow some of these agreements. We're not sure, but hopefully some of these agreements would uh, continue beyond that point. Um, I can tell you that uh, we are working very closely with the UK government um, to set the, set the foundation for a, a future bilateral relationship. Um, if some of you recall when uh, Prime Minister May went to Ottawa last September, actually just before CETA, um, uh, the CETA uh, uh, came into force, um, they came out with a bunch of different things to do. One of them was the establishment of kind of a trade working group. And so um, the idea is to try to ensure as much as possible a seamless transition from CETA to a bilateral re relationship. Officially, we're not allowed to do trade negotiations, and we're not doing that. But at the moment, we're looking at areas of commonality. And so as soon as, they're able to, as, soon as the UK is able to, to move ahead with uh, their own free trade agreement, then we'll be in place to do it. So that kind of work is, is happening right now. And uh, in addition, in, a, in addition um, we signed a memorandum of understanding on uh, science, technology, and entrepreneurship. And, and that is actually opening, opening up a lot of doors because the UK is looking for international research partners uh, beyond the EU. And so we're seeing a lot of activity in that space well, which will, uh, which will trickle down to uh, a number of different sectors. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. <clears throat> We're now going to um, Ireland. John, our Senior Trade Commissioner at the Canadian Embassy in, in Dublin, is here. And he's going to, he's also um, a second timer on part of this tour. I did an event with him in Toronto for the Canada-Ireland Chamber of Commerce back in uh, October. It was my first presentation on CETA, and he was very kind to only correct me after I left the stage for all of the mistakes that I made. But uh, welcome, and over to you. You can, you can pronounce my name very well now, so uh, you know, all mistakes are ironed out. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you said, I'm John Roxburn. Uh, I have a, uh, a key message to share about uh, the opportunities of working in Ireland. A lot of things that I've heard, and you just heard from Greg, uh, a lot, there are a lot of similarities working in Ireland and the UK. Just the opportunities maybe are scaled down because the, the Irish market is, is much smaller. Uh, one of the other things that is scaled down is also the, the size of our embassy. We're three trade commissioners who help you in uh, any and every industrial sector, so we're very happy to, uh, to uh, hear your inquiries and help you uh, gain access in the, in the Irish market. So um, in terms of why Ireland, again, as, as Greg was saying with the UK market, there, there's such uh, strong historical ties and cultural ties, family ties with Ireland that doing business for Canadians in Ireland is actually quite easy and a lot of Canadians find it kind of like working, working at home. It's a small uh, but very wealthy and open economy. It's one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world, which is, which is quite astounding. You've probably heard the phrase, the, the Celtic Tiger, how Ireland opened up its economy a few decades ago and grew at a rapid pace. You've heard of the, the problems post-2008 when the financial sector there collapsed, but probably not very well understood in, in Canada and, and around the world is how Ireland has really rebounded from that post-2008. It's, it's leading the, the EU in growth over the past uh, few years. It's uh, reaching kind of maximum capacity in a lot of its, of its infrastructure. Uh, it's one of the few countries in the EU where demographically it's growing both uh, from Im immigration and, and ind indigenously. It has a very highly educated workforce and has a lot of industrial priorities which are very similar to uh, Canada. So the Canadian technology companies who are working in the sectors that I'll uh, speak about in a second. Uh, these are all also priorities in Ireland where they're, they're, they're building, uh, building their economy. Uh, so first of all, in ICT, uh, Ireland has a great success in attracting American FDI investment. Some of the global leaders, names you've heard of, like uh, um, Microsoft and Intel, uh, Apple, all have very substantial investments in Ireland. So uh, if you're a, a 
a, a firm that can sell technology or services into major multinationals. There is actually a, you know, a, 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 a large component of a supply chain that's run out of Ireland for exporting internationally that you can tap into with CETA now. Um, Ireland is pitching itself as kind of the internet capital of Europe. So uh, companies like Facebook and LinkedIn and Google all have very substantial operations in Ireland to service uh, a, a regional or, or a, a global, global market for certain uh, areas. And uh, Ireland, as I said, is a very educated workforce and it has a, a very strong innovation infrastructure. So to work with Irish research instit institutions, for example, to localize your, your Canadian product or idea uh, for an Irish or for a European market is a, is a very good way to, to gain access. Um, infrastructure is a is really a, a huge in-demand sector in Ireland. Post-2008, the, the, the government had a lot of constraints on how it could spend. So Ireland's really emerging from a decade-long um, uh, uh, dearth of infrastructure development. And the government is starting to invest more and more now uh, in meeting some of these critical needs. They invest about 6 billion euros a year in public infrastructure. And really, they could use probably about 12 billion. Uh, but they are limited just because of the financial constraints of their bailout that they can't run government deficits. So they're looking more towards PPP partnerships. So that's a, an opportunity for Canadian businesses to sell both within the infrastructure project, but also to invest if there are uh, Canadian investors and there are quite a few large pension funds that, that are now in the Irish market uh, on that basis. Um, in terms of uh, Canadian companies for a long, stand, long time have had a great success in the Irish building market. market. Uh, Canadian products are understood to be of very good quality and they address a lot of the needs that are, that are there in the Irish uh, market for things such as uh, energy, sustainability, uh, high quality, uh, n n new materials, that sort of thing. And as well um, in areas such as engineering services, uh, design. Uh, there's also a lot of collaboration. There's Irish Investment in Canada and, and, and a lot of uh, small Canadian companies who are, who are coming to Ireland finding success. Um, in clean tech, uh, Ireland has a very substantial uh, onshore uh, wind farm base. Uh, they're starting to develop their, their offshore wind and ocean-based uh, ocean renewable energy, both uh, tidal and wave. Here in Nova Scotia, you probably know DP Energy is one of the uh, major uh, Irish companies that's working in the Bay of Fundy. There's a lot of cooperation between institutions, uh, between Canada and Ireland, and there's uh, 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 institutions like uh, Smart Bay in Galway and, and Mara in Cork, which work with Canadian companies a lot. Um, in terms of water and wastewater, Ireland is moving from a model where they had uh, locally based, locally run utilities for water to a, a national utility. Um, and so they're making a lot of uh, upgrades uh, as a part of that changeover. So there are, are great opportunities for Canada in the water and wastewater sector and uh, a new, numerous types of things that for people in the sector would be familiar with, things like um, removing contaminants or extracting uh, heat from, from wastewater, uh, trenchless technologies so you can, you can um, uh, restore pipes uh, more efficiently and, uh, and a better cost. So some tips on doing business in Ireland. Again, um, as, as Greg, Greg was saying, you know, the, the effect of Brexit and what it'll change for Canadian exporters in the UK market, but um, you all also have to understand that Brexit will have a huge impact on the Irish market. The value chains are very closely internet between the UK and Ireland, so a lot of the major products that you see on the shelves in Ireland are actually come from UK distributors. Some of that fish and seafood that gets sold into the UK market is probably packaged and sold on the, on the stores of grocery stores in Ireland. So um, we don't know what the terms of Brexit will be. We don't know if there will be any uh, uh, customs or duties or logistics constraints at the border. Ireland is very concerned, but from whatever does come from it, they're, they're very well maybe different, greater opportunities for Canadian companies to get in there as potentially UK businesses or dis, are dislocated or people's uh, retail distribution uh, model changes. Um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a market that really insists on high quality, uh, but they do pay a high price uh, to, to purchase uh, you know, competitive uh, goods and services. So that's uh, uh, very beneficial for Canadian companies, but it's also something to 
to think about when you're, when you're entering the market. The high price means that it costs a lot if you're exploring opportunities to come over. The, if you go to the hotels and it costs in, in Dublin, the major cities, very, very, very high. The, the cost of employees is going up if you're making investments. Um, in terms of infrastructure, again, if you're in the infrastructure sector, yes, there are business opportunities to be had, but for everyone generally in the market, the infrastructure is actually a, a growing cost of doing business. The lack of housing uh, means it's really hard to get employees who will work in Dublin or Cork or, or Galway, the major cities. But um, in the end, uh, Dublin and the major cities do offer a very young, uh, educated, uh, technically proficient workforce. So if you're thinking of establishing sales offices or technical offices there, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, talent to draw upon. And finally, the, the component of how CETA can help in, in the market, of course, uh, there are a lot of, of the major export categories that we deal with both in exports and imports with Ireland. And many of them actually go both ways, so it sh shows that Canada and Ireland already have a very good uh, global value chain in these th areas, such as chemicals, machinery and equipment, and medical devices. The tariffs are totally eliminated in our major categories. Um, Ireland office, offers a great and easy entry point now for the Canadians look to explore not just selling in the Irish market, but throughout Europe and even regionally to uh, Mideast and North Africa. A lot of uh, Canadian, even small-sized Canadian companies uh, find Ireland as one of the least challenging markets for them to establish, gain that foothold, and start uh, exploiting the opportunities that, that are there in the European Union. And finally, I guess it's, it's worth pointing out that um, Ireland has a very uh, intimate business relationship with the UK, but also with the US. The, the major FDI investors are Americans. Their, major, their, their, their two major export markets are the UK and the US. So, the businesses that you're likely to deal with in Ireland are very used to North American business practices, business standards here. Uh, there's increasing uh, direct air links between, between Canada and Ireland. So I think you'd, if, you'd, if you do come, and I hope you do, um, you'll find that uh, there'll be a, a really warm Irish welcome for you. And uh, I hope, hope uh, wish the best for you for uh, much success there. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We, uh, we not only there. invited John because he's been on uh, kind of a, one of these trips with me uh, before, but we thought that his accent would add a little bit of a European uh, flavor to the, the event today. That's an Irish accent. That's, that's right. <laughs> he's a, he is a Canadian diplomat, but I mean, he's got an Irish accent. I don't know why. But the other thing, um, the other thing uh, we wanted to tell you is that he did mention that it's very expensive to stay in Ireland. Uh, in Dublin, but anybody that's registered today can stay at his house anytime <laughs> you go over there. In fact, um, and when you come, that, that's right, Oswald, that's right. And you can also, when you come to Ottawa, you can stay at Francis's house if you need a place to crash as well. Um, Samina. Samina is joining us actually for the second time on one of these tours. She'll be back again in March uh, uh, going uh, to Western Canada with me. We're going to... Uh, where Alberta, we Alberta and Manitoba. Alber Alberta and Manitoba. We're actually touching every uh, province uh, before March 31st of this year on this roadshow. This is our first one, as I said. But she, um, she did part of the pilot with us, uh, with Nicole. Where's Nicole? Johnson Morrison from NSBI. Nicole organized uh, an event for us in Sydney, Nova Scotia in November. And um, Samina called in by video conference from our Canadian embassy in The Hague and uh, was a, a big hit. So we asked her to come back. Uh, for the Atlantic tour, and as I said, she'll join me again in March. So, Samina, thanks for coming back, but this time in physical presence. Over to you, and then after her presentation, we'll have time for a couple of questions before we start the next panel. Samina. Okay, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, good morning, everybody, or I think it's, uh, it's good mid-morning. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I've been posted in the Netherlands for about a year and a half now, and in my last posting, that was in the Czech Republic, and that's when the CETA negotiations got launched back in 2009, and I was really pleased, you know, after a number of years, it's, uh, it's now in provisional application. So what I would like to do, and how many minutes do I have, Sanjeev? Okay, all right, great. Um, tell you about the... Uh, about the Netherlands, and so first off, why? Well, the Netherlands is one of our most important trade and investment and innovation partners. So in terms of trade, the 2016 figure of bilateral merchandise trade was about $6.5 billion. 
and the Dutch are the second largest investors in Canada. As well, there's a very vibrant innovation and technology exchange. There's a number of Canadian and Dutch research projects going on at any time. And one thing that's, uh, you know, that's really, really struck me is just how much activity there is between Canada and the Netherlands. And of course, we've got very strong historical and cultural ties, and that's due to Canada's role in the liberation of the Netherlands in World War II. And there are, I think, over one million Canadians of Dutch heritage. So it never ceases to amaze me. I'll be in some small town or some place in the Netherlands, and people say, where are you from? And I'll say, well, I'm originally from Alberta. I've lived all over Canada. And they'll say, oh, I was just in, you know, and they'll mention some very, you know, very particular kind of places uh, that I've never been to, never even heard of, and that's where their cousins are. So like, uh, like my colleagues here, everyone's got a relative. And, uh, and yeah, it just never ceases to amaze me. Um, the Dutch are very, very strong supporters of CETA being a trading nation and they continue to show their, report, uh, their support and their economy did uh, very well last year amongst the top in the EU with about a 3.3% GDP growth. And the Netherlands, you can see on that, uh, that map there, it's the, of course the, the orange, uh, orange country just on the, the left of, of Germany. It is the gateway to continental Europe and the port of Rotterdam receives about 25% of Canadian exports to the EU and Netherlands is truly an excellent logistics transportation uh, infrastructure, whether that's rail, uh, road and, and port. There's a very international business climate in the Netherlands. The embassy estimates there are 160 Canadian firms active there. There's a very skilled multilingual workforce and again, uh, you know, I think uh, Dutch people speak very, very good English and, and usually a couple of other languages. And of course, there's a competitive 25% corporate tax rate. So that's an uh, overview. Now I'd like to tell you about a few sectors of interest. And I'll start with ICT. The Netherlands is a very, very connected country. Their internet penetration is something like 97% of households. And uh, people are very active in terms of online shopping, uh, online banking. ICT, it's a very large sector. And the turnover was about $60 billion in 2016. That's about 6% of, uh, of their GDP. And uh, the Dutch really are leaders in uh, areas such as fintech, uh, regtech, something I recently learned about, all the cyber security that goes around fintech. Um, and as I mentioned, online banking, online shopping. I'm really impressed, you know, people there, they don't, uh, they, they do go to stores, but they don't really have, um, let's say, Amazon there. They've got their own, it's called bowl.com. And uh, I'm always surprised, I'll, I'll meet someone and say, oh, where did you get that? And they, they order it online, it's there. I mean, they have really, uh, really fast timelines of delivery and it's just the expectation there. You know, very sophisticated market and they, they really do rely on that. And ICT is one of the most innovative sectors. Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, were invented by Dutch individuals. And the Dutch, they're early adopters of new technologies. So it could be an interesting test bed uh, if, uh, if companies are looking to uh, get into Europe and try out their, try out their technologies in, uh, in the Dutch market. And in the Netherlands, you will find the largest cyber and security hub and in that regard, what I wanted to mention for any uh, companies, SMEs that might be interested, we offer together with some partners, it's called a soft landing program. So the Embassy of Canada, the Dutch Embassy, together with some local partners, the Hague Security Delta, we offer a program whereby an SME could come and they can each either virtually land or they can physically set up there at the, uh, the Hague Security Delta for a few weeks or a few, um, a few months. And there they have access to, it's a hub, it's a community of companies, about 400 Dutch and international companies in cyber and security. And as well, there's the possibility for mentorship. So it's something we're promoting as well. Dutch companies can also, uh, they can also soft land in Ottawa. So if anybody has questions about that, please come and see me during the export cafe. Now another area I'd like to talk about is clean tech. The Dutch have set some, uh, ambitious renewable energy targets domestically as well they have uh, they have targets at the EU level and by 2023 there's something called the Dutch Energy Accord which is going to uh, going to require that the 16 percent of Dutch renewable energy use uh, is is in place and they seem so far on track to meet uh, to meet that 
And in this regard, the government has budgeted $18 billion in subsidies for renewable energy projects, and they're going to be launching uh, two calls for, for projects this year in March and in October. Offshore wind farms are also in the pipeline, and of course, any technologies to lower costs are welcome. Now, I've got to say, the Dutch renewable market, it is very mature. It's innovative. They themselves have great, of course, you know, wind energy, uh, windmills and such, uh, as well as technologies for capturing and converting waste gases and the conversion of biomass to bioenergy and bioproducts. But that being said, um, if a Canadian company has an innovative technology that they're looking for, that, uh, that's always welcome. I can think of two examples of companies, Canadian ones active in the Netherlands, that are uh, working in the recovery of nutrients from wastewater and also disinfection of wastewater. So though it's, uh, it's in itself an innovative area, there's always, always room. The Dutch are always interested in, uh, in innovation. Now, agri-food and seafood. You've, heard, uh, you've already heard uh, a lot of information uh, this morning from my fellow panelists and our speakers. And I wanted to tell you a few interesting, interesting points here. The Netherlands is the largest agri-food trading hub in Europe. And so that means it's a real point of connection for agri-food investors, as well as distributors and uh, importers. And they are, and this was something I've learned since I've been there, the second largest exporter of agri-food worldwide. So they import, in certain cases, uh, you know, the raw materials, process, and then re-export. And the Netherlands is the third largest market for Canadian agri-food in Europe. And so what are they importing? Uh, a range of agri-food items such as wheat, soybeans, pulses, cranberries, and blueberries. And on the seafood, uh, frozen and live lobster, fish oils, and processed shrimp. And I remember the first week I was in, uh, in The Hague, that's where our embassy is, I went out for dinner at a seafood restaurant and it was great. I opened up the menu and they had, they had a list of things and it actually said Canadian lobster. And I thought, like that. <laughs> They're specifying. Um, and uh, we're seeing an increased consumption of fish and seafood uh, by, by Dutch, uh, Dutch people in the last, uh, last few years. So the, num the Netherlands definitely punches above its weight in agribusiness and uh, the distributors are bu and buyers are purchasing for Europe as well as global markets. And I'd just like to share with you uh, just a, a little anecdote about the eagerness of a certain importer of Canadian seafood. Um, when we thought that uh, the provisional application would take place in July, this gentleman had already brought in a lot of frozen seafood from Canada and he had it stored in a bonded warehouse frozen, just waiting for the, uh, the tariffs to be eliminated. So I thought that, that, that's eagerness. And so that tells you something about the market. If there's an opportunity, um, they, uh, the, the Dutch will be there. So eventually he did get to clear his shipment. Uh, that was more in, I think, September 21st. And, <laughs> and we're really pleased. We've had a few delegations last year um, from Atlantic Canada, um, a couple of representatives of NSBI. So there's a real interest. And myself and my team, we're seven all together. We look forward to working with you. And um, next week, or I think it might be the week after, uh, the agriculture minister from Nova Scotia, uh, Colwell, Mr. Colwell, will be visiting the Netherlands uh, with a delegation of growers that are interested in innovative greenhouse technologies and materials. Now, just a, a, a reference to uh, green building. This is a niche area where we see some, uh, some potential with the European trend towards sustainable building construction. The Dutch are looking at tall, build, tall wood building design, and there is a need for expertise there, both in architecture and engineering. That building you see on the slide, it hasn't been built yet, but it's called the Hout Building in Amsterdam, and it's going to be the, uh, the tallest uh, wood frame construction, 21 stories for residential and commercial use. So in terms of doing business in the Netherlands, as I said, uh, they are they're very interested in Canada, specifically, I mean, right now what I'm aware of, uh, a lot of interest in, uh, in seafood and agri-food. But uh, I would say have a strong value proposition, uh, visit the market, follow up, perhaps come on a trade mission. As I mentioned, we had some new exporters come through last year. We're looking forward to more. And definitely follow up. The Dutch are, are very, very strong on following up. If there is some kind of a connection made, um, good to repeat your visit to the market or they will come to see you. And it is a good, uh, it is a good test market 
if you're looking at continental Europe, English is spoken and there's a very similar business culture. And uh, I will say again, as my colleagues have said, CETA can really help you in, in certain areas. Of course, we've heard about agri-food and seafood, but uh, ICT and, uh, and across the board. And as well, I wanted to mention labor mobility. I know we're going to hear some more about that, but if you're, for example, providing services, uh, the possibilities under CETA can facilitate that as well. So that's just a little bit of an overview uh, covering everything from cybersecurity to, uh, to lobster. But as I said, my team and I were really interested and we're, we're there as part of our international network uh, to uh, assist you with your perhaps first time foray into, uh, into the Netherlands or expansion of what you're doing there. So thank you very thank much, you. Samina. Well, it's almost a bit like we've had a, a trip across Europe having all of these, uh, these great <laughs> senior trade commissions. We didn't have to pay for it, which was even better. Um, thank you very much. Those were, those were fantastic. We're, um, we're about three to four minutes over schedule right now, but uh, we're going to take a couple of questions. If you do have an appointment scheduled with uh, one of the senior trade commissioners, please don't ask that question again here because you're going to have your one-on-one -on -one during the Export Cafe. And as Kathy mentioned, there are still some slots available. And after you've heard these four... Um, excellent presentations. I'm not leaving you out on purpose, Francis. It's because we, uh, the European ones were, uh, were very, very interesting, and that's why we brought these guys in here from Europe uh, to talk to you. If you still want to meet some of them, there are some slots available, and I think they sign up with right outside at the, at, at the registration desk, so you, you still have a chance to, uh, to, to meet one of these uh, senior trade commissioners um, uh, in person if you want. But uh, if you do have a question, we, we'll take two only so that we don't run too, uh, too far over schedule. You have to speak into the microphone uh, because we are live streaming. Um, there are people tuning in all across Europe to watch this event today, so we want to make sure that they... Um, <laughs> this is now rating number two after, uh, after uh, Europe's Got Talent, so we've got to make sure that we can, can hear us. Does anybody have a question or shall we move on to the next panel? If you do, put up your hand. We have one way, way there in the corner. And... Alexand is going to take the microphone over there. Thanks kindly. Uh, we've, we're looking at a partnership in Germany. Could you just give us uh, a one-minute hit on Canada's feeling about dealing, doing business with Germany? We've had uh, Jason Tolland with us. Uh, he's the Senior Trade Commissioner in uh, Berlin, and he's been with us on our first pilot trip with Greg uh, Houlihan, and we did that uh, across um, Ontario, uh, Quebec, and we came to Sydney, Nova Scotia, Jason and myself. Um, I would recommend, uh, maybe Nicole, we can send him some of those, um, Nicole Johnson-Morrison from NSBI organized this session in Sydney, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. And that's where we got the idea to, to kind of, we, we fine-tuned our presentations here based on that. But I think Jason's um, comments at that event in Sydney, which happened in November, might be of help to you, and we can share those with you. But basically, um, very bullish on um, Canada-German uh, uh, cooperation. We have, as we speak right now, our, our Chief Trade Commissioner, a, Dr. Eilish Campbell, our boss, is in Munich today uh, with John Manley with the Business Council of Canada and Minister Champagne uh, meeting with German business uh, leaders um, and uh, the, 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 the kind of activities that are happening around this Business Council of Canada group, which Mr. Manley heads, uh, our minister and Dr. Campbell is, is exactly to promote Canada-German uh, business ties. We are very, very positive on this market. Um, which is obvious because you have these three heavy hitters in Germany today as we speak, which is why Jason is not here, uh, but he will be joining us again in February. But I would recommend that uh, you look at some of the, uh, the notes that uh, Nicole sent us from that event in, in Sydney in November. But he's very bullish on this. We have great, great, great uh, relationships with, uh, with our German counterparts. Um, Jason's got a big team there. And uh, I think the proof is in the, in the pudding. So the fact that we have three of our senior Canadian officials and a former official, Mr. Manley, in Germany today just proves the point that that's what we're, we're, we're looking to expand. We, we, might, we might, might want to uh, also note that um, outside of Berlin, the capital, there's also consulates in Munich and Dusseldorf. So there's a very good geographic spread in, in Germany. Yeah, in fact, we have, uh, in Europe, we have 28 points of service, the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service. We have 28 points of service. That was on Francis's slide. Uh, the only country where we have three offices is Germany. So we have, we're, present in, we're physically present in 25 EU countries. But we, call, we say we have 28 points of service because we have three in Germany and two in Spain. So the fact that you, we have 
so many offices in Germany, I think is another, thank you, Greg, is another uh, testament to the fact that we um, have a great relationship with Germany. We have time for one last question, and then we're going to go to the next panel. Alexandre. I'd be interested in learning some of the advocacy e efforts of the uh, trade offices for Canadian companies accessing public procurement throughout Europe. Okay. Um, I can give a very general uh, overview of that, but if, if anybody wants to, to add to that, is there anybody that has something to say on that on the panel? You can think about it for one moment. But I will tell you, we are doing, um, we are our guide to doing business in the U EU that I showed you on our, um, on our webpage. Uh, lays this out, but basically um, what we have is um, we are training all of our trade commissioners in Canada and in Europe on public procurement and on CETA in general. Last week, we finished our cross-Canada tour for trade commissioners based in Canada, and it was headed up by our superstar uh, Canadian diplomat who's based in Belgium, uh, in Brussels. He works for the Free Trade Agreement Promotion Task Force in Ottawa, and he happens to be the husband of Michelle Cooper here. I've named her the first lady <laughs> of the tour. He is watching, <laughs> he is watching live, and I told him I was gonna put in a plug for him, so that's why I had to mention his name. What we did, sir, was we went to Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Halifax last week, and we did training for all of our trade commissioners, and part of that training was on public procurement. Next week, we start the exact same training program in Europe. Every one of these offices will participate with all of their trade staff in the same training program, and part of that, again, is on public procurement. So what we do is we send people to a website called ted.europa.eu. That is the public procurement site. It's equivalent to what our former Public Works and Government Services Canada website would be, um, and you can register. You have to register, you have to create an account, and ted.europa.eu. It's in many different languages. Of course, we use the English version. You can go in there and see all of the public procurement contracts that are available. Some of them, like the vast majority, are open for bidding by uh, Canadian companies. There are some thresholds. For example, we are trying to protect the SME community in Canada and in Europe, so we have a minimum threshold for the contract value that you can bid on to allow SMEs to bid on a number of these contracts and not face competition from large corporations. But in general, the vast majority of these public procurement contracts are open to Canadian firms. Um, you really have to play around in the system. Uh, JP Lemire, Michelle's husband, who did the training for us last week, uh, showed us a bunch of different cases where you have to go in and you really have to um, create your account and see what's there, uh, what you might be interested in bidding on. And then, of course, you can always work through um, one of our trade commissioners um, uh, yeah, based here or at our embassy to get more information. But um, the, the website is open. All you have to do is register. And our trade commissioners within the next three weeks or four weeks in, um, in Europe will be completely up to speed on it. Kathy Aliong here in Halifax had her training session a week ago Friday. And um, all of her trade staff were trained in it. In addition, we opened it up to every province. And they sent two representatives. We had NSBI there. We had Opportunities New Brunswick there. We had Newfoundland. They flew in. We did not have people from PEI. They were invited but could not attend. But we opened it to all of our provincial partners as well across the country. So people are more or less familiar with the system now, and especially here in Canada. So you can go in and make an appointment with Kathy if you're based here in Halifax, and she can walk you through the system. Yeah. Greg? Yeah, I, was, I would just add uh, specifically in the UK, um, I have a, an officer who's only responsible for infrastructure. And so he, he's constantly looking at the procurement opportunities within the UK. And also we have good contact with the devolved administration, so Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. So we um, are able to provide uh, information and advocate on behalf of, of companies and provide the opportunities. I'm also um, uh, in the midst, actually, of an en engaging a, an officer who's going to be focusing on uh, climate finance opportunities and because we uh, in in London are have the home of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development um, we also have uh, inroads there to the look at uh, procurement opportunities throughout um, the member states who are members of the EBRD so so there's a number of different uh, ways that we can go about that we have a comment from a COA as well here go ahead yeah, I would just like to note that the Atlantic Canada Chamber of Commerce also completed a uh, 
a study on procurement opportunities for Atlantic Canadian companies that you can find on their website. So that would be very helpful Good. for anyone looking at that. Great, thanks Excellent. for pointing that out. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap this up now because we're gonna move on to the next panel. But like I said, all of these officers, uh, along with the others that I've introduced uh, in the room throughout the morning, will be at the Export Cafe after. So if you need any specific information, please sign up. Um, Kathy, over to you. I think we can file off, right? Yes. I was just going to say, let's give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Even I, who've been a trade commissioner for almost 30 years, I learned a couple of things today. So far less uh, for, for those of you who are new to the European market. It's now my great pleasure to ask Kyle to come on back up here to introduce the moderator of our trade and services panel, uh, or panel, <laughs> one person, and um, in turn, David Plunkett, who is our moderator, will introduce our keynote speaker, who is coming to us all the way from Europe. Thank you. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, moderator for the next panel, which is a trade, uh, a focus on services uh, trade into the European Union. Um, and uh, Mr. David Plunkett is the uh, former Canadian ambassador to the European Union. Uh, and and this, this time I actually have a, a full bio, so uh, it's, it's a very strong bio for Mr. Plunkett. Um, he holds a, a BA uh, in political science from the University of British Columbia and then uh, follow that up with an MA in International Relations from the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, as I said, he was the ambassador to Canada, uh, uh, sorry, the ambassador of Canada to the European Union from 2011 to 2015. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 1981, first as a policy, uh, trade policy officer, then from 1987 to 1991, he was counselor at the Permanent Mission of Canada to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in Geneva. In his work abroad, he was also Counselor for Trade Policy at the Embassy of Canada in Washington from 1993 to 1997, and Minister Counselor Economic in London from 2002 to 2006. In Ottawa, he was Deputy Director of the U.S. Trade Policy Division from 1991 to 1993, and the Director of the European Union Division from 1998 to 2001. Needless to say, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of experience to be had from listening to, to Mr. Plunkett, so I, I look forward to, uh, to his comments uh, and the, uh, the other comments from this panel, uh, and I introduce you, uh, David, Mr. David Plunkett. It's a real pleasure to be here again. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to introduce uh, Pascal Canis, who is the Managing Director of the European Services Forum. Uh, I'm not going to read his uh, extensive bio, it's, uh, it's set out in the, in the package for you. Uh, other than to say that when I got to Brussels in 2011, uh, Pascal was one of the first to uh, uh, people that came to uh, to see me in the context of the ongoing CETA negotiations, and we uh, touch base throughout the four-year period there, not just on CETA, uh, but uh, he was also uh, extensively uh, involved uh, with the uh, US-EU negotiations, the so-called TTIP, uh, which seems to have gone off the rails, at least for the time being. Uh, so all this to say uh, that you couldn't get a, a better speaker to describe uh, what is going on in the services area than Pascal. Uh, he'll describe to you what the Euro European uh, Services Forum is, its role, and, uh, and the importance of the EU uh, services market, and how CETA has changed things indefinitely to the better. Uh, and both during this panel and during the Export Cafe later, uh, he'll be able to discuss uh, any particular opportunities and, and questions you may have in this area. Uh, services is, a, is a, um, an important area, uh, and it's important that when you're talking about the services area, uh, you also need to be looking within the CETA in terms of things like temporary entry, domestic regulations, 
uh, mutual recognition of professional qualifications. Uh, there are specific provisions on telecommunications, electronic uh, commerce. Uh, it is a complex area, uh, for sure, uh, but I don't think there's anybody who can describe it better than Pascal. And by the time you leave here, you will actually understand the differences between mode one and mode two and mode three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, before turning over the floor, um, uh, while uh, it's, you know, there's been a lot of important talk about trading goods, uh, in fact, uh, services uh, makes up 70% of both the EU and Canadian economies. Uh, in a 19, uh, 2015, service industry employed, employed more than 12.7 million uh, Canadians. Uh, and so when you're starting to look at statistics uh, and the impact on the economy, uh, you would be vastly underestimating the, uh, the extent of, uh, of the economic impact uh, when, if, you, if you don't properly analyze the services area. Um, it was just sort of uh, shown, I think, how old I am by, by listing all the things that I have done in the past. Uh, one of the things that I did early in my career uh, was I was a delegate to the uh, Canadian, on the Canadian delegation to the so-called Uruguay Round, which ultimately became the World Trade Organization, uh, which uh, still is the main instrument uh, guiding multilateral trade. Uh, in those days, which was in the late 80s, uh, services was one of the so-called new issues uh, that was brought into the, um, into the Uruguay round. Uh, and uh, the first few months, few years, the negotiators didn't even have a clue as to how to look at these uh, areas in the, in the context of a trade negotiation. So we've come from sort of an adding, being added on to the multilateral trading community in terms of a, of a negotiation to now making up over 70% of the economy. So there's been a huge swing uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, we are strong in areas where the EU, uh, where there's EU demand. Uh, I noted that both uh, Greg, John and Samina all highlighted ICT as a priority sector. Uh, infrastructure was noted in, in Ireland, green build in Holland. So um, while the, uh, it is important to focus on things like seafood and agriculture and whatnot, uh, don't overlook uh, these, these important areas. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to uh, Pascal and hope I didn't scoop him too badly. <laughs> Thank you, David, and uh, th thank you for the invitation for having me here. I'm going to try to drive you in the world of services. Also, most of you are in the services but don't know, and I'm going to try to convince you about this. So what I'm going to try to do, I have a long list of slides because I thought that it would be good to, for you to have uh, the, the possibility to have the information by yourself later on. I'm going to go th through this quickly, but if you want to get a uh, time then to read after that, um, you could do it later. I'm going to show you what is uh, quickly very e ESF, the trade in services and investment in figures, and then showing you that services is more than what you would understand by services, i.e. banking and telecom and professional services, and much more than that. And then I will go through what is in, in CETA for, for services. <coughs> so. Um, I am a lobby, a lobbyist, and, and, and my organization is a lobby. We are representing companies' uh, interest for international trade uh, negotiations. And we, organize, we made this organization because the agricultural world is very well organized. Manufacturing companies are very well organized into a trade association. And you know, we're 28 countries, and therefore you have to go through the national levels. But services was, were nowhere in terms of international trade. And, and the, the negotiators could go to one room to brief all the agriculture people, could go to one room to, to brief all the manufacturing people, and they have to go to 30 different rooms. So I have 30 different associations in 30 different services sectors, who many of them actually don't know what they are 
actually services. Because if you bring, if you talk to a retailer, he's going to concern himself as the importer and exporter of goods. And if you go to a um, construction companies, he's going to say, of course I'm not services. Construction is something you can see in concrete. Well, actually, it's construction services, and they are into these sectors. And if, if we want to talk about international trade, negotiations, it's one package for all the services sectors. This is where then we convince uh, our members to come together and bring their interests. So you can see here some, some names of services sectors. Insurance, banking, business services, professional services, construction, distribution, etc. And I will go through this along my presentation. Here are so lo logos of um, uh, my members, some multinational companies, and not only European, but multinational companies, because we are talking about global companies willing to export from the EU. And here are some of the logos of the um, uh, association. So European sector-specific association like European bankers, European satellite, European telecom operators, European construction companies, all of that are based into European association member of ESF. We all know that services is representing a very big part of our GDP, and for EU is, is about 73%, and for Canada is 70.8%. 70, so why, when we talk about international trade, we always come up talking about agriculture, agriculture, and agriculture again. Maybe a bit of cars and textile. And I'm going to try to show you why. First of all, maybe some figures saying that the EU is by far the biggest exporter of services, and that is the reason why my organization is very strong in pushing for the, for the negotiations. Because if you look at your figures of Canada export to so the rest of the world, you will have US, Germany, UK, you will not find the EU. When we talk about export, it is a second column. EU extra export is about 915 billion euros per year, uh, dollars per year. Uh, but normally you also have to see the, the trade between the European countries if you do consider we, we take the national countries statistics. Canada is also a very big exporter of services. It's the tenth in the world. Uh, but you can see that the EU is, is far beyond. And that is the reason why when we talk about international trade, the European Union countries know that there is no point to sign an agreement if there is no big chapter on services and concession on services. When we talk about export of services, usually for the last uh, uh, 20 years, it's first ex it's per travel and then transport. So tourism, if you wish, and transport used to be more than 60% of international trade in services export. But nowadays, it has completely changed. And the biggest export that we do is business services. And actually, the biggest figure is any other business services, which is appalling that actually a huge chunk of our export, we don't even know what it is. We know exactly how many uh, uh, watches or how many lobsters would be exported, but we don't know about a large point of figures, 27.5% is at business services. But I'm going to try to come back to this later on to, sh to show that actually we now have a better idea. So here is the evolution. You can see in 95, um, travel and transportation in red and in, in uh, green were about 60% of all the EU exports. And nowadays it is exactly uh, the, the reverse. We export 60% of business services and travel and, and uh, tourism is, is 40%. So you can see that business services is growing, also commercial services is growing. Uh, that is the export of goods and the export on training services. You can see that actually the um, uh, uh, export of goods is, of course, yet because we talk about balance of payment bigger than export of services, but when we will go more into the details, it's actually going to be a bit different. More importantly is, is the trend. I started to look at these figures in 2009 because that was the beginning of the negotiation of, TISA, of CETA. And you can see that in the meantime, you have got a significant growth of export from the EU to Canada and from Canada to the EU, even before CETA was applied. I'm, I'm saying to, to, to show you here, and we will of course now follow up and monitor the, the, the trend in the coming years, but 
The fact that two countries are negotiating a trade agreement is already giving a significant signal to the business that these conditions are going to, to, to improve. And, and I think it's, it's a trade agreement is, I, mean, I used to say, is like a one-page advertising in the Financial Times to say our market is open. Even if nothing changed, the fact that you have a call to the exporter and investors, it is making already an impact. When we talk about export of services, we are missing a very large part of what services companies do. A very important part of the services activity of a company is actually to go access to the international market, is to go to the country, establish itself, and get on the local market. That's called foreign direct investment. The foreign direct investment are not into the trade figures I showed you before. But this is our best way to, to, to export. The problem is, you need to have an international trade agreement to open the market. But once it is open and that a company would have chosen and taken this opportunity, it will not export. It will be part of the local GDP. If a French company is coming here and establishing it in Halifax and getting access to a, a, a subsidiary, it will become a, a Canadian company doing business to Canadian customers. It will not export. But without the CETA to open up the market, maybe that company would not have, have access to it. So, and a difficult angle of showing what is important in, in trading services to have concession in a trade agreement is because it is part of international, trade, international foreign direct investment. Here you have the figures of the outward and inward. If you look at the second column, you can see that 87% of all inward investment coming to the EU is actually in services sectors. Of course, it is not making the, the, the headlines of the news saying that there is a new car plant or a new Bombardier establishing blah, blah, something which is visible for the, for the, for the, for the camera. But investment, foreign direct investment, the large bulk is coming into the services sectors. And we are also big investor here or everywhere else in the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, these are the foreign direct investment figures, which is showing you that Canada is also a very big exporter of investment, if you wish, i.e. foreign direct investment coming uh, to the rest of the world and into the EU. 3% of all investment coming to the EU is coming from Canada. So, in terms of balance of payment, the EU is exporting to Canada 34% of all our export are services. And 28.8% of all Canadian export to the EU are services. So it's not only about goods, but it is not the majority, clearly, in terms of balance of payment. But now I'm going to try to drive you to the, to the notion of what we called mode five, or a new world invented by Swedish colleagues from the from National uh, Board of Trade is servicification. It's to try to show you that actually when you are into mining, when you are into fishing, when you are into agriculture, when you are into manufacturing of cars or textile of machinery, you are also exporting or you are also uh, into the services business. This is what we call the services around the products. Because in all good manufacturing or agriculture, whatever, whatever companies, in addition to the services themselves, you have embodied services and you have embedded services. I'm not going to go too much into the details here, but it is saying that if you want to be efficient into exporting your lobsters, you need to have a good lawyer, you need to have a good banker, you need to have a good uh, legal serv um, uh, accounting services, which is part of your efficiency, so that you're going to be able to focus on your primary task, which is uh, uh, fishing, and which is whatever uh, you do. And that is so services embedded into, um, and embodied, sorry, into what you're doing. And then many companies, when you export a, a plane, when you export a train, when you export a car, you also export a lot of services around these products. And now a train probably will have to make a discount to get the market on the machine itself. 
but you will find then that you will make a market for 20 years contract of maintenance and repair. And this is where the money is. And maintenance and repair is a service. So if we look at this smiley that maybe some of you know this, this, this uh, slide, it's about the life of the product and it starts with a very high value into, first you need to get the idea, you need to have research and development, you need to have de in the designing and engineering, etc. before starting to produce your, your product, to manufacturing, to assemble it, and then you need to sell it. And there you need also additional services. You need logistics, you need um, branding, advertising in cars, for instance, a lot of advertising. Then you need to have uh, customer services, so after sales services, the garage, etc. All of that is service. But when you export a goods, when you export a car at the border, in the balance of payment figures we've seen earlier, it's 100% a good. So it appears in the, in the other side, but actually, if you take the steel, the rubber, the plastic, and whatever you have as a, as a, as a raw material into a car, it's maybe 10% of the value of the car. All the rest is services. Now, our colleagues in the European Commission are saying mode five is actually services around the products, but when the negotiators are negotiating on the goods, a car is a good, and therefore when you cross the border, if there is a tariff, you pay a tariff on the totality of the car. While actually you're not supposed to pay duties on services. This is now a new thinking. Why should we pay a tariff on a service? You're not supposed to do that. You pay duty only on a good. But I'm not going to go too down into this because it's going to draw, drag too, too long. But now uh, the OECD and the WTO have found a new way to calculate the services around the products. So here you have the figures. For the EU, 39.9% of all the value of the goods that the EU is exporting is actually services around the products. And the figure for, for Canada is 34%. So 34% of all your goods which are exported to the world are actually services around the products, which is a very significant amount of money. So uh, uh, this is the, the, the summary of, of making the distinction between balance of payment and trade in value added, this new database that OECD and WTO have developed, where you can now find figures uh, uh, where are the services run products. So worldwide, in terms of balance of payment, the EU is exporting 31.5% of all its export are services. But when we include the services around the products plus the traditional services, so the banking, the telecom, etc., we go to 58%. 58% of all the export of the EU are actually services. And for Canada, it's 28.8% in balance of payment, 44.8% of all export of Canada in terms of value added are services. This is now a picture which allow us to have a complete different way in thinking our trade policy, which should maybe not only focus on trade and agriculture and trade in, in, in uh, um, manufacturing products, because the money, the value of the country of export and the money for the companies who export are actually services also and services around the, pro the products. So that is the, my introduction for, for all the different figures. Uh, now let's go in terms of how do you negotiate trade in services? You know, it's not like for the goods where you focus on redu reducing the tariff, you focus to try to have rules of origin as clear as possible, we've heard all of that earlier on. You try to have uh, the cert certification and standards uh, as, 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 as better as you can. So that is for, so for, for the trade in goods. For services, not at all like this. You have to find a different way. So in this slide, I try to summarize what are the different ways of companies to export a, a service. You have four modes, four ways. The, the red line is a, is a border between country A and country B. First, you have what we call cross-border supply. The, the company is in country A, the customer is in country B. None of these are going to move 
And the service is going to be provided either by someone else, i.e. a shipping company is going to transport the goods for you, or you're going to have a electronic commerce transaction. You don't move, the customer is not moving, someone is going to, to travel the goods for you, but the transaction is done across the border without nobody moving. So that's cross-border supply. The, country, the, the, the mode two is called consumption abroad. The, country, the company in country A is not moving. It's going to be the customer, i.e. the tourist, who is going to move from country B to country A to come and consume the service of the company. And I can tell you a very large majority of these people don't know they export. This hotel, when I pay my bills this morning, has exported hotel services. And if you go to a restaurant, it's the same. This also is a case for the medical services when people are going to come to another country and be cured there. Or for university when your, your children are going to move to another country and pay the tuition fee in a university. So that is export of services that the university maybe doesn't know, but it actually does export. This is mode two. The mode three is what I mentioned to you earlier about the foreign direct investment. It's a commercial presence abroad. Country A, country B, company A, company B, Company A is actually going to move in the country B to establish itself, create a subsidiary, create a joint venture, buy a company or, or green, uh, complete greenfield uh, investment and set down into that country to have access to the consumers of that country. So that is commercial presence abroad. You need to make sure that there is no barriers. So the negotiation are necessary, but actually it's not going to be increasing the export, except maybe after five or 10 years, when this company is going to grow up, is going to establish itself, is going to maybe make some benefit, and at a, after a point in time, the, comp the, the, the headquarters is going to say, that's good, but now, you know, all the money I, I gave you at the beginning, you have to, to send back also some company back to the, to the shareholders. And the money will cross back, and therefore that might be part of, of, of the benefit of the trade agreement. But it will not be part of the international trading services. And finally, the mode four is what we call the movement of natural persons. But don't forget, it is part of international trade in services. It's about trade in services, and therefore it is not about migration. It is not about employment. Here we're talking about country A, country B. The company from country A has got a contract with a company from country B, and the way to fulfill this contract is actually to send someone from the company to go to the other country, make the service for two weeks, for six months, or for two years, and come back. That is movement of natural person or mobility uh, of employees, if you wish. We're going to come back later on. So I'm not going to go more into this, except maybe that the mode one is very much also about cross-border data flow. Everything today in manufacturing and everywhere, digital, digital manufacturing, um, uh, internet of things, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, all those machine to machines, it is about data. If there is something in a legislation providing data to flow freely, it is going to be an impediment to cross-border data trade, to uh, data flow, and therefore is going to be making uh, things more complicated, more costly for companies. I'm not going to go too much into this. Uh, this is, you heard uh, this morning about the HS code. So for the goods, any single good has an HS code. If I want to export this uh, remote control, it has an HS code. Well, for services also, it is not well known, but all services are also have a code. Um, here it's a, it's, it's, it's a 2,000 pages document, but the WTO has found a way to uh, summarize it into uh, 20 pages and 12 chapters, which are the headlines of what we are. And that is helping the negotiators from two countries. When we talk about integrated engineering services, if they want to know exactly what they want to talk about, they can agree that this is effective what we're talking about, and therefore we can use this, this number. Because otherwise, you know, you can negotiate something, and then suddenly you believe you understand that it is not talking about exactly the same thing. So that is the way that the trade negotiators are going to understand each other well. Contrary to services, to goods, sorry, um, there are many ways of negotiating access to trade and services. And that is making even things even more complicated. We have a positive list 
And that means the negotiator is going to say, for banking access to uh, uh, um, whatever specific uh, sector, uh, a service, if they don't list that HS code, or whatever you, you want to name it, it means that this services is not committed. So on the positive list, only what is written is going to be committed. The negative list, which is what in the CETA has been used between the EU and, and Canada, for the first time for the EU, it is exactly the reverse. Everything is open except what is not open, i.e. what is not conform to the fact that it is open. Well, that's the reason why we call the conforming measures, non-conforming measures. And that is, i.e., only restrictions are listed. And to make things even easier, the EU has invented a new one, which is called the hybrid list, for, uh, established for the TISA negotiation, trade in service negotiation in Geneva, with some 20 countries, uh, which is a mix of, of two, and which is making things a hell of a job to understand and to, to make it uh, um, work for, for companies. But that is, uh, unfortunately, what we have to go through. So for trading services negotiations, you have three components. First, you have the chapters in which you're going to write the disciplines for all the, uh, the, for the two parties. Then, and, and you will not be able to understand the commitment if you do not read the three parts. They are all integrated, and if you read only the chapter, or if you read only the annex, you will not get it. So you need to, to have the chapter in cross-border services, in move on natural person, in domestic regulation, I have the list later on. Then you have the annexes, which contain unilateral declaration. So things, most of the time, actually exception to the rules, and therefore that's the reason why you need to, to go through this. And then you have the schedule of commitments. The schedule of commitments is that each party is listing the restriction here uh, when we talk about negative list. In a summary, this is what um, the OECD has produced that, is what uh, they call the lake. It's the, bit, the, the difference between what the committed level by the countries in the, David mentioned the, the WTO negotiation, the, the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade in Services. So that was to 1999 and for financial services and telecom in 97. And what is the practice? Because some countries have not committed under an international trade agreement, i.e. under international law, but actually are practicing better regulation for foreigners. They say, we have done a reform, we think it's good for, for foreigners to uh, have access to a country, and therefore, we're going to make it easier for them. But it is not bound into an international treaty. This lake shows you the difference in terms of applied and, 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 and bound tariff, if you wish, for the services sectors. And this gives us the opportunity to understand that some countries are more liberal than others, and some countries have, have made things. Um, uh, so you can see that uh, a lot of work to be done. For Canada, the, the space is still relatively wide between the, the practice and the commitment into the GATS. So the whole exercise of CETA was actually to reduce the, 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 the blue space here. So what is it now for, for services in CETA? Uh, that's, these are the guidelines, so there is no need to go through this. Um, what I was saying at the beginning, saying that trading services, normally so I would look, look only at the second line. But actually, my organization is looking at all, the, all what's happening in all the other sectors, also essentially everything in red, because we are interested in much more than what is in trading services, only because we're also investing, interested in investment, in data flow, in public procurement, in regulatory cooperation, etc. For the max, so for the trading services, you have the market access pillar. Then you need to go to the regulatory cooperation, whether you'll be able, by the two parties, agree to go further after the negotiations. And then we will have a look at the movement of natural person and mutual recognition. So these are the chapters for services. Cross-border trading services, temporary entry, mutual recognition, domestic regulation, financial services, international maritime transport, telecom and electronic commerce. These are the 
links of the different annexes, which you would need to go through also. So if you would get access to my, my slides at a point in time, there is a link to all of these uh, chapters so you can have more information on that. And these are the annexes. So the annexes is a schedule of commitments where Canada and the EU will list the restrictions. The Canada has decided to, to uh, f have first a federal level and then the different uh, provinces and territories. So you would know what it is not possible to do in Canada. So for businesses and, and uh, for companies, a negative list approach is much better, much easier to understand because you will find exactly what is not possible and then there is a, a reference to the, to the legislation which is telling you what you cannot do and all the rest you can. So that's, you know, you don't need to, to, to hire a lawyer, which is a service, to uh, know, better understand all of these things. And the EU did the same. Um, Canada wanted to have a specific way of doing for the financial services. The EU considers the financial services is a service like any others, but uh, Canada and US and many other uh, countries in the world have a specific way of doing for financial services. So this is why Canada has Annex 3 and we don't. In these annexes, you will find exactly what it is not possible to do, for instance, for financial services in Canada. This is a slide uh, where I have listed all the sectors where the EU has given something to Canada, which is an improvement to what the EU gave to the GATS, so to the WTO. So you can see that the EU made some efforts to do something. I will not go through all the details because it's going to take years and hours at least, but uh, that is where all the services that the EU gave something to Canada. Those in, 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 at, the, at the lower part of the slide are services that the EU didn't make improvement, but actually is not making any uh, improvement to any country in the world. We're negotiating with more than 20 countries now. Uh, and and uh, health services, education services, um, uh, social and health services, you know, all of those sectors are very sensitive in the EU, are actually public services, and therefore uh, we don't take commitments. That's the reason why I put a specific slide on public services, where the EU uh, and Canada have made some specific provision to protect these services, uh, and uh, therefore uh, they are not open to uh, international uh, competition. The EU has three layers of protection. First of all, you have the, the government authorities, the, the services which are done by the government. So that is defense, police, justice, etc. Then you have the public monopolies and concession, where the EU is going to give either the, the, EU, the, 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 the public service are not competing at all with the private sector, or ha, are giving concession to one company and it is not open to competition. But then you have many services where actually are, the public services are competing with the private service. And how can you protect the public service when they are supposed to compete? Well, they, the EU found a way to express this into a trade agreement saying that everything which is funded but by uh, a public authority uh, are not considered uh, as open to the competition. Public procurement and investment protection, uh, quickly to say that uh, Many times people believe that public procurement is actually buying uh, a car or buying uh, a desk for the officials. But the bulk of the money that the government and public authorities are spending are actually into services. They need energy, they need telecom, they need banking, they need uh, uh, lawyers, accounting, they need uh, clearing services, catering services, all of that is services. Plus, even if in, in public procurement it is divided into a third category called works or construction or, or infrastructure, everything related to building uh, uh, highway, uh, energy, uh, plant, public, public uh, nuclear plant, etc., these are actually construction services, architect services, energy, um, uh, engineering related services, so all of those services are also a part of the public procurement. That's the reason why our companies are very eager to look at whether progress has been achieved into the public procurement chapter and, and annexes. <coughs> investment protection, I, we, I told you that for us we invest very much also, so uh, investment protection is very important for us. Uh, I will skip all of this. Uh, regulatory cooperation is something uh, very important. 
but diverted once again most of the trade negotiation when we talk about regulatory cooperation actually they're thinking about standard uh, on goods uh, and, and we have difficulties to make sure that actually the regulators uh, regulating uh, the lawyers, the accountant, uh, the, the bankers should talk to each other and, and see whether it is possible to improve the relationship through the regulatory and without going back to the negotiating table. Let's come, uh, what is the time, David? Um, let's, come, let's come to the uh, movement of, per, of people. It's about temporary entry. It's about the possibility for a Canadian service provider to go to Europe for a temporary period of time to do the services he's meant to do there and come back. So it's always about temporary. It's not about employment. It's not about migration. We have gone through, the EU has made offers, gone through all of these categories, essentially three categories. Intra-corporate transfer. This is about people working in a company is sent to the subsidiary or to the joint venture of that same company. So someone from Bombardier going from Bombardier uh, uh, here to um, where we heard in, in Belfast. So that a person is going to work for that company for two years. That is intra-corporate transfer. All of the <coughs> possibility to do that are actually listed into the, into the agreement. Basically, no barriers. All intra-corporate transfer should be able to come in. Then you have business visitors. And then you have contract service suppliers. Maybe let's focus on contract service suppliers one minute, because this is what is new really into the CETA. It's about the possibility for sending someone from Canada to the EU, not to a subsidiary, but to the client. And to go, and if you are an IT engineer, if you are a lawyer, if you are an accountant, you can go from here to your client, provide what you have to do for one or two weeks, and come back. That was very difficult, if not impossible, long time ago. Now, through CETA, is going to be possible. For, not for all sectors, but we have the list here. The EU has listed 37 sectors where it's going to be possible for providers from Canada to move to the EU, in, the, in all EU countries, or all of these sectors. Of course, you do have some conditions. Uh, you, so you know, you need to get your visa. You, sh you should not be uh, on on a penal uh, list, etc. And then uh, you would need to work for the company maybe for one year, or you will also need to, uh, to show your diplomas and qualification, so that or that uh, the company will need to show the contract that the company has got from the client, so that you will have to show to the migration authorities, you know, you're going there for a specific time on a specific period of time, here's a contract. And also, you will need to show that you are working for the company for at least one or two years. The last, uh, there is an, uh, the, the last category is an independent professional. That is a person who is, who's got a contract with a company in Europe, but he, he doesn't have an employer. He's working for himself. Here, the negotiator said, OK, we are willing to get these guys because maybe there is a very clever uh, IT person who invented a new application, and we should give the possibility to this person to move into the EU. But we don't want that these guys are going out of the university and then establish themselves forever because this will not be temporary. And therefore, they put further conditions, i.e., for instance, you have to show that you're working on that specific uh, sector for, that, for six years. So, you know, the idea being if you work for six years, uh, you are well, well established into your, into your country and your family, etc. So it's more difficult for you to move. The last slide is uh, mutual recognition of professional qualification. This is about um, the possibility for lawyers, accountants, all of those who, f to do their job, need a, quali need a, a license, need to show their qualification, their diploma. It is very difficult. So you need to get access to the country, you need to have access. So we need to make sure that at the beginning we had the access. Then you need to have the mode four, the possibility to get your visa. But if you go to France and you say, I'm a lawyer, I'm going to, 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 to do uh, uh, French law tomorrow here, they're going to say, da, 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 da. no, no, you have to tell us, you have to show us that you are actually qualified. That is the obligation in, in France and all EU countries to, you, have, you are a lawyer. And then it's going to be said, well, I'm, I'm a lawyer for Canadian law only. Well, this program is showing the possibility if the two mutual prof professions, the lawyers, for instance, or the architect, are willing to do so, 
to work together to find a way to recognize the qualification of each other to say, okay, uh, you are an architect for Germany, you are an architect for Canada, I have done, studied all of this, you have studied only this, you are missing that specificity, for instance, for head, uh, earthquake, you will need, you are allowed to come to Germany, but you will need to do six months additional qualification of specific things if you want to get this qualification in Canada. So it's quite complicated, but we finally found a possibility. It was, it was, it was a long way to go, but we did it. I stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we're running tight, so I'll um, uh, maybe have time for one or two questions. But let me just say a couple of things that Pascal uh, slid by quickly. Uh, one, if you ever wondered how you can have a 1,600-page uh, agreement, I think Pascal uh, demonstrated the complexity of it in just this one little area. Uh, there was an earlier question about procurement. One of the slides he, he sailed by and uh, noted that the EU procurement market is worth $3.3 trillion. And so there are opportunities out there uh, to be pursued. Um, this, the emphasis on temporary entry, uh, if you want to see a big difference with the NAFTA, which is being currently negotiated, by, uh, led by the guy who negotiated uh, the CETA agreement on our side at least, uh, you'll see that the CETA is now miles ahead of where the NAFTA is, uh, reflecting that NAFTA is, a, is, is, is an old agreement. And so the, the, the Cadillac or the Platinum Standard, whatever you want to call it, uh, for temporary entry and this sort of movement of people reflect, reflecting globalization is very much now the, the CETA agreement. Um, and with that, maybe you see if there's a, a, one question I can take. Ready, ready, quick. Yeah, uh, you, Pascal had, uh, had expressed earlier that he is willing to make uh, the, uh, the presentation because obviously it was uh, fairly dense. <laughs> Anyways, let me, uh, let me ask everyone to uh, once again thank Pascal for a highly informative uh, presentation. <laughs> So you can see why Pascal said you can't do this in 45 minutes, but we will make uh, copies of the presentations available to everyone who has registered to attend today, and those will be sent to you uh, courtesy of NSBI uh, after the event. Um, for those, I'd, I'd like to invite the next panelists uh, to come up, to start making their way up. I noticed that some of them have already been wired up. For those who haven't, uh, if they can just step over to the corner there to get your wireless mic, similar to what we did for the STC panel. Um, and lots and lots of details, clearly very important to many of you in the room on services, both David and Pascal will be at the Export Cafe, and you can also grab them at lunch, sit next to them. There are no appointments needed to meet with them this afternoon. First come, first serve. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce your moderator for this panel, uh, and one that we've all been waiting on as well. I would like to introduce uh, Elise Rassico, who is currently the manager of Can Export. This is a funding program of which you will hear more in the panel. Elise joined Canada's Foreign Service in 2002. She has served abroad as Consul and Trade Program Manager in Sao Paulo. She also for a while was the Quebec, Quebec government's head of mission in Brazil on deployment from our department. Elise holds the distinction, ladies, of being the first female Canadian Trade Commissioner and Vice Council in the Islamic Republic of Iran, a post she held earlier in her career. Yay! <laughs> she has also in our department worked on the Russian desk and as the program officer for clean development in Central America and the Caribbean. A very diverse career, typical of trade commissioners. Over to you, Elise. Thank you, Cathy. And this is great because the microphone is already at my size, which usually <laughs> doesn't happen. So thank you for that. Um, I think we're really lucky today, so I'm going to try to speak as little as possible because the people that you have in front of you are a wealth of knowledge of how you can best access 
support and help from the different levels of government in this uh, experience of exporting, which is often a, an endeavor. I, I think we have a slide that we can go through. Oh, okay. Well, to next the, the next one. Yeah, this one. So this one will stay the whole time because uh, what we want to do today is try to show what's the, uh, the, the um, exporter journey, if you'd like, and the different stages of it and how the different partners have different tools and support they can offer to your company in order to achieve those stages and get to export success. So basically, uh, we'll go from the export planning part, so basically market research, connecting with partners like the ones you have in front here, um, and navigating through gov government program in general. Sometimes it can sound a little bit like an alphabet soup, you know, with all the acronyms and whatnot. Uh, I think what I personally would like you to, to take away from today is that we all work really closely together and we're all there to connect you to the right person. So there's no wrong door. Um, so that's one thing. And then we're going to go to uh, going to the market. So once you've had this first contact and the market research is done, what are the next steps in terms of the planning, general business advice, and, uh, and finding foreign market contacts. Then into the financing, because we all need money in order to realize those complex endeavors. And finally, uh, the, when, when you see you're ready to enter the market and often have a presence locally, what does it mean and how can we help you? So um, I will quickly uh, ask my colleagues to introduce each other um, and then we'll ask a few questions uh, that will allow them to talk a little bit more about the different type of supports their organizations offer. So maybe we can start with you. I am Jonathan McCauley. I'm the Senior Government Relations Officer for the Canadian Commercial Corporation, known as CCC. My role is to build partnerships and to build awareness to Canadian exporters about our service to uh, Canadian companies in terms of foreign uh, procurement markets. Hi, I'm uh, Doug Phelan, uh, COA Nova Scotia, Manager of International Business Development. Um, I th most people know a fair bit about ACOA, but if I had to say it in 10 words or less, basically to create opportunities for e economic growth in Atlantic Canada. Um, small team that we have here in the office, uh, a couple of account managers, uh, John McKay, Craig Williams, and Louise Daphne are Did back you in want the office. To raise a hand or something? You're no, they're, they're no, back they're in the not, office. Okay. I counted them before I left, once in Toronto, actually. <laughs> um, and then one of our uh, colleagues who uh, did such a good job that our Moncton office just raided her is actually in the office, Darlene, or in the office, in the building, Darlene Sponicle. It's a fantastic colleague. And uh, worth mentioning as well that one of our partners we work closely with, Canada Business, Paul Duran, is just down the hall. and. I mention him because he's going to end up a point of contact later on. That's me. I'm Carolyn Wood. I'm a senior account manager with Export Development Canada, or EDC. Um, EDC is Canada's export credit agency, and we're here to help companies go grow and succeed internationally. Uh, joining me here today is our regional vice president, Ed Steves, who's in the, here. And uh, all we do is help companies export and finance those exports and mitigate risk. Perfect. Uh, Kyle Smeisser, I'm the Director of Export Development at Nova Scotia Business Inc. And uh, we've got a large uh, group of individuals here, as, as Laurel, our CEO, mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, feel free to talk to any of them uh, about any of our services and programs at any point. But really what, what NSBI focuses on is two things. Uh, investment attraction, so working to, to, to help companies set up locations in Nova Scotia. And then the side that I focus on, the export development side, helping companies like yourselves export more. And from our perspective, export is really anything outside of the province of Nova Scotia, a little different than the international uh, the perspective. But, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Christine Smith, and I'm the Regional Deputy Director for the Trade Commissioner Service Office here in Halifax. Um, we serve the Atlantic region and uh, we work with our colleagues uh, all over the world who some of have spoke here already this morning. Um, we do have trade commissioners uh, here today and I'd like to point out that Stefan Crepeau is here, Gaetan Martineau is in the room as well today, and Alex Selangtan. Uh, all trade commissioners, we serve all the Atlantic region. Uh, all of us here today are based in Halifax, but we do have trade commissioners in the other Atlantic provinces as well. And we're here to provide trade commissioner service on the ground support in Canada and to connect you to our networks abroad. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Oldfield. I'm the manager of consulting services with Business Development Bank. 
BDC. And uh, very quickly, what BDC does is we help companies to grow and become more profitable. And we do that in two ways. We do that with money and advice. So we provide uh, term loan facilities and we provide consulting services. So thanks everyone. So as I, I told you, there's a lot of letters here and sometimes it can all look really <laughs> complex. But what we want to make sure today is that you understand the, the different types of services that you can leverage in order to make these uh, EU opportunities uh, real for, for your company. And by the way, I'd like to mention that Pretty much all of us and a lot of our colleagues will all be available this afternoon at the Export Cafe for one-on-one -on -one discussions. So if you do have any, we'll have time for questions this morning, but if you do have like further discussions that you'd like to have with any of the different organizations that are here, please do come this afternoon. This time is for you, and uh, we would love to have many, as, as many as possible of you with us this afternoon. So I'm going to ask some questions and direct them to, to different people. Uh, and we're going to, as I mentioned, go through the different stages of the export, uh, export journey or the export path. Uh, all of those steps are really crucial in making it all the way to a successful endeavor. And we, we know how complicated this can be. So planning, like in any, uh, in any sort of, uh, of um, development plan, is really important. So I would like to know uh, what would be the advice that your uh, organization and yourself, based on your experience, would give to a company that's planning to export for the first time or planning to expand to a new market entirely? Uh, and how could your organization assist them in this preparation work on how to avoid pitfalls? So maybe I'll, I'll start with, with Doug on uh, how ACOA can do this and what would be your advice in, in this sense. It's like being in school when you don't know when you're going to get asked, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I'll say everything good and there'll be nothing left for anyone else. Um, you, know, you know, it's quite a, it's, it's one of those questions you could give a really long answer to. I actually have about a 90-minute presentation when I go and do this, and I won't do that because you'll never get to eat today. Um, but, you know, I, I say to people, don't lose sight of what got you to where you are. Um, you know, you're in business, you're successful for a reason. Don't overcomplicate it. You do have to do your research, obviously, going into a market. There's so many resources that are right in front of you. If, if you're in the seafood business, don't come ask me what it's like to sell a lobster. Go ask Osborne. He'll, he'll tell you or anyone else in the seafood business. It's, it's free advice. Uh, I was, you know, a few years, well, more than a few years ago now, I remember I, I ended up working in Ottawa for a couple of years. I must have did something bad to deserve that, but no offense to Ottawa colleagues. <laughs> but it used to surprise me how many firms from Ontario used to want to have a cup of coffee with me to ask me about doing business in Atlantic Canada. And they'd look at, it show, this is what I'm going to go and present, this is what I'm going to do, what do you think? And when you'd look at it and say, well, you know, probably you shouldn't call them blue nosers or newfies, and you'd get past that, but it'd be amazing what people were going to put in a, in a presentation. Um, so I always say don't lose track. And there's obvious the basics when you're going into any America, whether it's next door, down the street, or across the world. I always say to people, look, it's like taking a walk in the park. Don't step in crap. And crap really is, uh, you know, be, be wary when you walk around culture, religion, attitudes, and politics. And consultants in the room, if you mentioned me in that footnote, be, pr correctly spell my name. But I'm um, uh, just joking. Anyway, the, um, in terms of programs, we do have a, a, I guess I'll talk to them when we go through this, a lot to help people when they're early on, whether it's, uh, you know, um, we do a lot of doing business in sessions. Uh, we have new exporter programs. And, you know, the other thing I'd say to folks, you obviously came out here today. That's the first step. Thanks, Doug. Yep. Uh, Caroline, what about EDC? Uh, any specific support and, and services that you can uh, refer to in terms of that first stage of the expert planning? And Absolutely. As Doug mentioned, research is very, very important. Uh, at EDC, we've done a lot of the research for you, so we have a lot of information on our website that's sort of set up as self-serve, so you can look for information. Our economics <laughs> team has developed market profiles of uh, countries, um, taking into account our experience, taking into account political situations, um, currency, all of those sorts of risks and, and situations. So you can go online and you can look and see what our experience has been, um, how much support 
uh, has been provided in that market and can kind of give you some information. We also have a number of white papers. Um, if you're just starting exporting, we have a great one called The Six Steps to Exporting that you can find online. We also provide information via webinars, um, participating in sessions like today. Uh, Sanjeev met mentioned earlier today the tariff finder that we've partnered with BDC and Global Affairs Canada to develop. So that's online as well. Um, that's all part of the information that we provide. So there's lots and lots of research and, and information available. Um, so it's important to take the time to, to research. It can be a little intimidating, I know, but there is a lot of information to sort of guide your, your research. And I have to say that we're really, I wouldn't say jealous, but we, we find that the wealth of information, like from the Trade Commissioner perspective and, and from my own perspective, for sure, the wealth of information available on the EDC website is incredible. So really uh, in putting more emphasis on Caroline just said, it, there's really a lot of things in, out in their uh, website that's really worth it for uh, exporters that are looking at that first step. So yeah, I, I would echo the, the same thing. Um, what about the provincial uh, views on this uh, first step? Absolutely. Well, so, I mean, uh, new exporters would be a, a key goal of, of Nova Scotia Business Inc., trying to help companies take that first step into exporting. And uh, we have a lot of tools and a lot of services that, uh, that we can provide those companies. But I, I would say, first of all, we have a team of export development executives, a number in the room here today, that would just be happy to sit down with you uh, at, and talk with you about what exporting could mean to your company, and help you uh, identify challenges and opportunities that, that your company could, could look at. We have a self-assessment tool on our website. website. It's a 10-minute tool that could be your first step. And then we have actually a longer guided assessment tool that our export development executives can walk you through and, and really understand what, uh, what challenges that you guys might need to address to help you take that next step into exporting. Um, we talked, Doug and Carolyn talked a little bit about uh, research. We certainly have uh, a great research team at NSBI as well. We do uh, trade market intelligence, about 80 reports a year for companies uh, on markets as sort of an initial research into a market so that you don't end up on the ground and realize when you get there, maybe this isn't the right market for me. But I guess taking one step back, I think the, the key is we, we think you should dive in and export. Uh, we absolutely do. We think you should do it. Um, that being said, we think you should make sure that you, you plan ahead, um, develop an export plan, and, and, and try to make sure that you've, you're, you're um, cognizant of what might happen when you actually try to export. So uh, we do have a program called the Small Business Development Program that uh, helps companies hire consultants to develop an export plan. Um, uh, it provides $15,000 of funding on uh, 50 cent dollars. Uh, it's a popular program and it's something that you might want to look at if you haven't developed an export plan. It's, it's something that, that could help you do that. Um, other, other than that, we do have a lot of uh, topic specific and think export workshops um, that, we, uh, that we run throughout the province. Uh, so if there's a certain topic or if it's just thinking about exporting in general, I would recommend uh, attending uh, one of those sessions as well. And like I said, uh, as always, the one-on-one -on -one work that we do with companies, we're always happy to talk to a company one-on-one -on -one in our office or in their office, wherever it may fit best. So, yeah. And, and if I may just build on one thing that Kyle said about like not hesitating to become an exporter when it's your first step. Uh, I think one of the, the things that we heard before from our senior trade commissioners team and from uh, some of the presenters and how some of the CETA opportunities have been unlocked by, by this new agreement, uh, often companies tend to think as the U.S. as a first market, but uh, with this new agreement, uh, Europe uh, and, and the different markets there could be just as easy and maybe, maybe even easier in certain cases and certain uh, sectors. So uh, even if you haven't exported before, uh, using all those services, you could unlock these opportunities even if Europe is your first uh, target market. And we see increasingly, and anyway, from my own perspective, putting my can export hat, uh, we see a, a lot more uh, small companies that are looking to export for the first time, not in the US. So this might be an opportunity to look into that and, and take that step into uh, a, another market that might be really profitable for your company. So just, Christine. 
Well, I think a lot of what I wanted to say has probably already been said, and Kyle and I already talked about this this morning. Um, the Trade Commissioner Service is very well positioned as well to help companies that are looking at exporting for the first time. One of our key services that we do offer is called Preparation for International Markets. That's what we advertise, that's what we do. Um, we have trade commissioners working across the country and around the world in over 160 cities, so we have good coverage. And trade commissioners working in the region are more than happy to sit down with companies and, similar to Kyle's team, talk about what it is you're looking to do. And we would use our network abroad to help find those answers to questions you may have. There's tons of tools online. And you saw some of them this morning. There's the, the guide uh, for exporting. There's uh, Kyle's tools. There's EDC's tools. Do your homework. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the main thing. Get your homework done. Uh, before you plan to go abroad. For those questions that you can't find answers to, we're more than happy to help PATH find ways to, to tap into our network abroad to get those specific types of answers and guidance that you need. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're looking at exporting and you're, you're doing some research and you don't know where to go, just give us a call. Give any of the people on this panel a call. We do a lot of referrals back and forth between our organizations and we do work very collaboratively. So that would be my guidance and advice. Yeah. And that's a, a great key thing to remember. Again, no wrong doors. All those people work together, mm -hmm. so don't hesitate. If you, if you need something, you'll, you'll find the right path by knocking on any of these doors. So from a BDC perspective, what would be this uh, first step, the advice that you could provide in the services? So if you're a company located in Nova Scotia and uh, you're interested in exporting, the world's a pretty big place. So it's a little bit like uh, deciding to compete in next month's uh, Olympics, uh, let's say downhill skiing and you've never skied before. <laughs> you may want to start on the, the bunny slope, right, uh, before you hit the double diamonds. And uh, that's to see if you have the, the skills and the competency. So I, I think that the, probably the first step that we would advise someone is to do a, a growth potential. Uh, and, and really what we would suggest uh, with, uh, with that first step would be does your organization have the potential right now to become a successful exporter? And so by, by definition, we would look at the operational capacity and the organizational capacity and the financial capacity because uh, we would uh, expect you to be set up for success. So within the operation, do you have the capacity to expand production and so forth? Um, do you have access to supply chain uh, that will set you up for success? Do you have the right organization? For example, uh, if you're going to set up in, in France, do you have anyone in your company that speaks French? Um, do you have the financial capacity? Uh, if you're, all of a sudden your business takes off and you double, uh, that could put a potential strain on your working capital and, and other financial resources. So that would be step one. And step two uh, might be looking at your, uh, your highest potential market. Uh, again, I mean, just looking at the EU, you're looking at uh, in, in around uh, 25 different, uh, different uh, countries, different markets. Which one represents the highest potential? And we would uh, suggest that would be supported by research. And then probably the third step would be uh, to develop a market entry plan. And that's one where we would suggest looking at your um, competitive uh, analysis and, and your, uh, your risk management, so risk assessment. And, um, and just to develop a, a strategic plan that, that looks not at a transactional basis, but more of a, a sustainable growth perspective. And, and actually, that's a really important point. We see a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that they get all excited because they get a, an order internationally. So now all of a sudden, they're an exporter, right? But unless that's uh, fit in a coherent strategic manner, the next order might be on the other side of the world and, and so forth. And before you know it, after three or four years go by, you, you don't have a necessarily a, a, a market. Um, so it becomes, depending on what you sell, it can become difficult to support and it could strain your resources. So we would say in the development of that market plan to, so that it's a sustainable growth and um, the next level down would be an actionable, operational. Yeah. Uh, plan, so, yeah. But that's a good point, and actually there's a stat that came from the BDC that are, uh, really stuck with me, uh, that most small business that become an exporter into new markets 
after two years are not present on, on that market anymore and often because of that step that's been missed. So hence the importance of that, uh, that planning and research phase and making sure that you, know, you have the capacity and, and that you are well accompanied in order to do this. Um, so once this research uh, is done, the market potential or the assessment of the company to become an exporter has been done and some preparation company is ready to go to market and do the promotion and meet potential clients. So what can your organization can do about this? And I'll, I'll start with the TCS because I'm a trade commissioner. So, so I think that we can do a lot in that sense. And not that the other ones can't, but hey, uh, I, can, I, I go with the family on this one. Okay. And Christine, could you, could you tell me a little bit more about how we can help in that sense? Um, well, you know, once the company has determined that they're ready to go to market, I think it's key to, to tap into some of our services. And, and there are two key services that I want to highlight. One would be market potential assessment. So we offer this to companies, um, and it's done mostly through our trade commissioners working overseas, to help companies really identify whether uh, their, their product or service is a fit for that market and, and what the competition is like. So, so you get that on the ground, uh, in market uh, assessment by a trade commissioner as to, you know, the probability of success in that market for you. The other important one would be the identification of qualified contacts. And this is something we do a lot as a department. And it's a really important uh, aspect because small companies may not have uh, the resources available to them to have good connections into a foreign market to understand uh, who they need to talk to, who the potential suppliers are, who the regulators are. Our trade commissioners on the ground overseas are there to, to network, to, to find those people for you. And, and they, they often come uh, to us from the local industry with very good Rolodexes uh, and very good understanding of who's who in their industry, how to do business in that market. So that's what I always suggest to companies. If you're going to go to the market, get that on the ground expertise that the Canadian government has, has put there for you uh, to help you become more successful. So those are just the two uh, that I would uh, say. Uh, in terms of accessing that, we're, in the regional network we'd be more than happy to work with you to identify who, who the colleague is at post, uh, best placed, who works in your sector, who has that level of uh, uh, intelligence and information that could really help you in the market. Thanks, Christine. And, and Kyle, what about the provincial take on this? So how can you help companies who are looking at that phase of marketing and, and getting to the market? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, step one is it, obviously we work closely with all the partners uh, that are here and others. Um, so we would we would certainly recommend, for example, uh, speaking with Global Affairs before entering a market. Um, but we do uh, ourselves do a number of trade missions every year. Uh, just uh, we work with partners such as ACOA uh, on these on these missions. We started uh, this year doing a lot more new exporter missions. So for companies just just trying to get uh, started with exporting, we did a, we did two uh, we did one into Boston earlier in the spring. There's another one into Boston with the Atlantic partners uh, that'll uh, happen in February. Just taking new exporters on an education mission and trying to get them to understand what it's like to actually go into market, meeting with a bunch of uh, specialists and partners uh, in market. Um, we also did a new to the EU uh, mission uh, just a couple months ago, uh, taking companies that have exported but not into Europe. So taking them to a new market and it's something that as, as we move into next year, we'll start doing a lot more of that. Um, we do missions as well with, with export ready companies, really focused on different, on specific sectors. So very sector specific missions on ICT, ocean tech, agri-food, seafood, uh, beverages would be the sectors that we're focused on because that's the, that's the province of Nova Scotia's priority sectors uh, uh, at this point. Um, we do a lot of missions into Europe, so uh, today we're here to talk about the, the EU. Uh, we've had a big focus on the EU over the last couple of years and that will continue as we move into next, uh, the next year or so as well. Um, the only the other thing I would say uh, from, a, from a actually going to market perspective is that for companies that maybe a, a trade mission isn't the right fit. If they want to go to market on their own, we do have a program called the Export Growth Program that's very popular. It's, uh, again, a $15,000, 50 cent dollar program that helps companies pay for travel to market and, and accommodations when they're in market to attend trade shows or to, to visit potential clients, it's essentially to, to do their own trade mission into a market. Um, and that, uh, that program has been very popular and, and will continue on as, as we move forward into next year, so. Thanks, Kyle. So from, a, a, again, a, 
in a COA perspective, because Carl mentioned working uh, mm -hmm. a lot with you on missions and whatnot. Doug, would you have uh, specific uh, programs or services that uh, you could highlight from an ACOA perspective? Yeah, Kyle is picking my pocket all the time. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. We, we actually, we work very close together. And I, I can't stress it enough. Everyone on this uh, panel uh, works very uh, close together. Um, there's no way you're going to be able to remember every program that everyone is uh, going through here this morning, and I don't think that's the intention. When I uh, got up and did the quick introduction, I mentioned uh, Mr. Paul Geran down, down there. He, yeah, he's still here. He didn't leave. I haven't been that boring. So, um, you know, Paul's with Canada Business. If, if you're going into a market, you're pretty much sure you're ready to go, and you just want to make sure you've checked out every program that's available. Someone like Canada Business is not a bad spot to give a quick phone call to and say, you know what, hey, I think I'm ready to go into the Turkish market but I'm just not sure who's, who's got what that I should, be, I should be talking to. And that, you know, is your final step kind of before you hop on the, the plane is not a bad thing uh, to do. Uh, you know, before I mention a couple of programs, to say simply, I mean, look at your company's bottom line and see what, what you're prepared to commit to the market and uh, obviously not spread yourself too thin. Uh, we have a whole number of programs. Uh, Kyle mentioned the uh, things we've worked together on with the uh, new exporter missions. If you want to take a lot of the guesswork out of this, it's the incredibly risk-free, easy way to get into market, get your feet wet and ensure this is what you want to do. Uh, a lot of folks say to me, you know, what's the value of going on a trade mission? Because we collectively all work on a number of trade missions. If, you, if you're going to a trade show and you want to look at what the cost of booking one of those booth spaces is yourself, then come back and talk to me about the, what the advantage is going in. To go in on your own, it's near astronomical. And to also get to go in right now and capitalize on the Canada brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you go in collectively as a group, and you also learn a lot from the other people who are on the mission with you. I think that's a real advantage to it. You know, in terms of programs, obviously we're involved in missions. We have uh, programs that help people prepare for, to get into market, to follow up, um, you know, probably going to eliminate myself from asking, answering the next question that you're going to ask in the next part, but essentially come in and sit down with someone and talk one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and get some ideas and uh, then see kind of where you fit in the programs. And, and on this point of the uh, presence at a, at a pavilion or something where you, you capitalize on the Canada brand, um, I think it's also worth mentioning that often you get a, a much better spot than you would at a yes. train show and, and then it makes it so much easier to attract uh, the interest of potential clients, so uh, just to compliment. Um, and from an EDC perspective, Carolyn, what, what would your organization uh, be able to offer at this point to companies? Yep. Uh, EDC uh, has an extensive network throughout Canada, but we also have 20 representatives abroad. They're uh, located in various locations throughout the world. Typically, we're co-located with the embassies or consulates abroad, and we have a couple of uh, standalone offices that we've just opened. Um, our officers abroad are really, their mandate is to, to promote Canadian capabilities, and one of the ways that we do that is really working with large international buyers in those markets, and we provide financing to those international clients um, with an eye to opening up their supply chain for Canadian companies. All of these financing facilities are online on our website, and you can uh, leverage potentially if you're interested in selling to one of these companies, you can perhaps leverage that, that relationship to access their supply chain. So that's one of the ways that we help. Um, I think in the, the going to market, uh, there's a lot of great resources. We do all work together. As I mentioned, we're co-located at the, the consulates and the, uh, the uh, embassies abroad. So we work very closely abroad with, with Global Affairs Canada. We also work very closely with them here in Canada as well. <laughs> And if I can say from experience, I've been worked in Brazil where we have uh, in two of our offices co-located EDC personnel, the uh, wealth of access they have to those big companies with whom they work and they have financing uh, facilities is incredible. So by all means, make sure that if your company can supply services or products to one of those companies that you, you uh, look into this and get in touch with them. And from a BDC perspective, what can be uh, achieved by a company by working with BDC on, on that part of the export journey? <clears throat> well, when, uh, when Kyle was talking about uh, going alone, it uh, reminded me of a company that we have, that we've worked with. And uh, before they came to us, they received an order. Uh, it was actually coming from uh, uh, a client that they had acquired in the US. 
and uh, the first order that came through represented more business than than they had done as an entire company for the entire year. So with that one order, they, they doubled. And the problem, which is a great problem, but they didn't have the capacity to fill it. So uh, we would probably suggest looking at, uh, at the organizational capacity. Um, and, and part of the, I guess the types of things that we would uh, help the company look at would maybe be a technology, like um, they're going to be dealing in different currencies, perhaps multiple currencies, and, and uh, tracking inventories overseas and across boundaries and, and so forth. So that might be an area that we would uh, encourage them to look at is whether they need to adopt some new technology, a robust system to, to handle things. Uh, you don't want uh, containers of uh, fresh seafood going missing, <laughs> for example. Um, that might be one thing. Another thing might simply be uh, uh, to examine their, uh, their, their productivity. And so if they're a processor, uh, how can they optimize that? How can they be as productive as possible? Uh, also certifications, um, things like ISO certification or CFIA or HACCP, any of those type of things are services that our advisory team helps companies with and a lot of times they come into, into play once they become an exporter. Not so much that um, it may not be that the, the regulations require it, but it might be just the, the norm of that market. Uh, a couple other things may be uh, simply on the, on the HR side of things. Uh, do they have the right organizational structure that, that works today and for tomorrow? Uh, really, it all goes back to the, the same point about a sustainable growth model. Um, so we, we would advise uh, companies not to be looking transactionally at this, not a, not a one here and a one there, but, but to build the capacity and to build it within a plan and so that their organization can, can grow sustainably um, in a way that doesn't jeopardize the mothership, right? You want to be able to keep the, the, uh, your home base of operations nice and strong and robust so that uh, you have a, a strong platform to grow. Yep. And, and while we're talking about these things, it often requires financing and money and, and, and uh, different type of solutions that the BDC also can offer. So now that you have uh, the, <laughs> the, the microphone, uh, <laughs> can you also tell us a little bit more about what the BDC can do in that, uh, in that side of things and the financing part? Sure. In, in fact, we're probably best known for our, our ability to finance. And uh, when it comes to international expansion, Things that uh, really um, are at the top of the list would be uh, could be the, your production. So um, we would look at uh, financing expansion. Uh, maybe you need additional uh, plant or land or building. Um, it could be simply to to beef up your inventory. So you know from that perspective, uh, BDC has something which we call the market expansion loan, and it, and it's for those companies that are looking to to grow and expand. And, uh, you know, there would also be uh, potential for um, acquisition of a, of a company in, in a foreign country. So we would look at uh, financing of that if, uh, if that presented itself. And, um, you know, just things like uh, financing technology, if it's a $200,000 ERP system, or financing uh, just some working capital to attend trade shows or, or to hire additional staff or to beef up your, uh, your marketing efforts. So all of these cost money and, and uh, the reality is in a sustainable uh, situation, you may not see a return for one to two to three years uh, from the investment uh, that, that you've been making. So it's really important to, to have the financial model in place, uh, which uh, it's very helpful to have um, have some uh, flexible financing in place to do that. Allows you to keep your head out of water and breathe while you're pursuing this longer term goal. Well, without jeopardizing your domestic operations. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And what about EDC? Uh, there's also some ways that you can offer some financing solutions for companies who are entering a market. That's right. EDC is Canada's export credit agency. So we were created solely for that purpose to fill that niche. Uh, niche requirement for 
Canadian companies and to help them with uh, risk mitigation and working capital solutions. So all of our products and services are really geared towards either mitigating risk or helping Canadian companies access working capital. So to give you an example of that, uh, one of the products that we're most well known for are our insurance products. So if you're going to a, a um, a foreign country and making your first sale, you have a decision to make. You can either ask for that uh, your, your um, buyer to pay you up front, which doesn't always work so well, uh, and you might be missing sales opportunities if you're insisting on cash up front, or you can provide your buyer with terms. And if you provide your buyer with terms and they don't pay you, that can be uh, really risky for your, for your business and for your bottom line. So we can step in and provide insurance solutions and we can be really creative around the solutions that we can provide to you. We can provide selective insurance coverage on just one or two buyers or we can go in and look at a whole portfolio credit insurance solution. Um, so with in, uh, EDC's insurance solutions you can sell to your to your buyer with the comfort of knowing that if your buyer doesn't pay we will we will pay you. So our insurance provides 95 percent of that receivable. So that gives you that confidence to grow um, that you're not going to be risking your bottom line. It also gives you the opportunity to perhaps um, export more and sell more by offering terms to your buyers. The other um, issue that clients have quite often going into new markets is how do you finance those export contracts and how do you build up inventory? How do you um, complete your product? Um, how do you uh, invest abroad? All those sorts of things can be um, difficulties for working capital for Canadian companies. So we, we have a partnership preferred approach where we partner with Canadian banks to help the Canadian banks be more comfortable to provide you with, with credit. So that program is called our Exporter Guarantee Program and we provide a guarantee to the bank to allow you to access that working capital. Um, those solutions, um, as I mentioned, can be very uh, wide base depending on what your need is, but it can help you execute your your contracts It can help you build up your inventory It can be specific to us one specific contract or it could be over multiple export contracts It can also help you invest abroad or um, uh, Hold inventory abroad. So that's another way that we help you access working capital um, a third way that we a third program that we have is around our insurance and bonding um, quite often in international markets, you may be required to put up a performance bond or a bid bond, depending on the industry. Um, and in those cases, your bank is going to require you to provide cash security for those bonds or uh, credit, and they'll tie up your, your operating line of credit. And that can be really difficult for your company and, and really restrict your cash. Uh, EDC can come in and provide what we call an account performance security guarantee, whereby we provide our guarantee to your bank, which t frees up your, um, uh, your capital or your credit for other purposes. So EDC has so many different financial solutions and risk mitigation solutions, um, but in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that. Um, but I will leave you, if you are going to export um, or currently exporting and you have a concern about a risk or you have a concern about working capital, we probably have a solution and we'd love to talk to you and we'll be around this afternoon in the Export Cafe. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, so, uh, of course, because uh, I'm representing an export as well by being here, I'd like to um, just say that uh, maybe in the interest of time uh, that I'll be here this afternoon so if anyone wants to know a little bit more about how we can also uh, with the Trade Commissioner Service provide certain uh, um, financing solutions for different things that go from market research to certification to going to market uh, and, and many other things uh, I'd be really happy to talk this afternoon with, with you guys and, and I think our Trade Commissioner Service team here knows really well about the program as well and so you can also reach out to them um, the final step so once you're in the market and entering it uh, some of you have touched on these things already but um, I'll ask uh, the CCC to talk a little bit because uh, you've been patiently waiting for this part where the Canadian Commercial Corporation can really play a role so maybe if you want to say a few words Jonathan thank you keeping the best for last <laughs> 
Um, so actually, it's great that all the partners are here at the in the front because we do work closely with all of the partners, and CCC is very uh, complementary to them. Uh, but we're very particular, and uh, we're in a very niche part of uh, international trade, which is uh, government procurement markets. Uh, so Sanjeev mentioned earlier the, that uh, Europe offers a 3.3 trillion dollar procurement market. And of course, that a lot of that you can find through um, the ted.europa.eu website for the, the tenders that are open. Where CCC comes in is uh, sometimes while you're doing your business development in Europe, um, there might be some more specialized uh, contracts that you're seeking. Uh, perhaps they're in the defense sector and the government is looking for, uh, has a national security reason and is looking for something very specific. Or maybe that government has an urgent nature and they're looking for uh, a, a, a capability, a service, or a product that your company offers. In those instances, that's where CCC uh, will come in. Oftentimes, you'll, either you'll know about us and you'll knock on our door because you're already having conversations about uh, entering these complex government procurement markets. Or uh, you'll have spoken to the TCS, and the TCS, uh, we're, we report the same minister, the Minister of Trade, and the TCS will uh, say uh, to us that they've got a, a Canadian company that has uh, a very interesting product that, is, uh, that has a, an opportunity to sell it to a foreign government. Um, they had, they're an experienced exporter, and uh, they're, they want to talk to you. So what we do is we talk to that company, uh, we get to know each other, CCC, because as part of our, our contracting expertise, we offer that foreign buyer a guarantee of performance of the contract. But for us to do that, we need to make sure that your company is able to perform that contract. So we do uh, quite an extensive due diligence process. So we make sure that you have the technical, the managerial, and the financial ability to deliver on that, that contract. We also make sure that that contract is uh, in a financial uh, area that is uh, similar to your own company's financial abilities, just to make sure that uh, everything will go as planned. Um, what we do is we then uh, work with you in terms of drafting a proposal. When that proposal is ready, CCC will submit it as an unsolicited proposal to the foreign government buyer. That foreign government will then uh, say, whether they're interested to work with us through government to government, which is sort of a, it's a commercial bilateral agreement that we do from government to government. So that's the tool and the mechanism that we offer you. And then what we do, if uh, the government agrees, is uh, we sign an agreement with you, the exporter, and we work together to negotiate that contract. CCC sits at the table with you on your side, looking after your interests while talking with that foreign government buyer. And what we bring is the Government of Canada's partnership. So we work closely with the TCS and with EDC especially if there's financial or insurance uh, reasons. And we'll uh, make sure that uh, you have the government's uh, support behind you, uh, the Canada brand package at the table. Now once that uh, contract is negotiated and it's a win and we're all excited, uh, CCC then uh, will sign a subcontract with you and then you'll deliver on all of the terms and conditions of the contract. And uh, we'll help to uh, uh, oversee the payments that will go through us. So we'll guarantee those payments. And uh, we'll also do any troubleshooting during the contract delivery. So just a question, Jonathan. There's often a misconception, I think, about the CCC that it's only for defense. But I think you can maybe elaborate a little bit and say how you're also active in other sectors. Thank you, Edis. Yeah. Yes, that's a great point. Uh, so CCC was originally created mostly for contracts that are in the defense sector. Uh, and we're, we're known for that and for our contracts in aerospace. But we have diversified and we are uh, active in other sectors, particularly the ones that were actually mentioned earlier today. Um, construction and infrastructure clean technology, uh, renewable energy and the environment, ICT, um, and, and amongst others. We won't, we won't ever say no where the government-to-government -government mechanism makes sense, that it's uh, a tool that can actually help you as an exporter. Uh, for example, we have contracts in Bangladesh where we have Canpotex 
that is exporting potash, which doesn't fall under any of our sectors, but it is a specialized product that Bangladesh would only buy through the government-to-government -government mechanism, as an example. Not in Europe, but an example. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. And you mentioned troubleshooting, and uh, I'm looking at Christine because uh, this is one of our key services. So maybe you can say a few words about that. Okay. Well, well, very briefly. So we're we're moved on to the last one, are we, Elise? Um, the last question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. We as a department and the Trade Commissioner Service do advertise that we provide commercial problem solving. So that can be really important for companies that are exporting into foreign markets because sometimes all your best plans can go wrong and you can have issues. Perhaps you have, uh, for example, a shipment that's been stuck at a border and you need some help clearing it through customs or, or navigating that system. So that's something that the Trade Commissioner Service can help you with. Uh, we have Trade Commissioners, like I said, in, in many places around the world, working out of embassies and consulates and high commissions. And they often have very good networks into those foreign governments and can help you pathfind through the regulatory bodies that you need to work through. They can also make recommendations on uh, professionals that can help you. Maybe you need a good lawyer in the market. So they would have a list of qualified, vetted uh, lawyers, accountants, third-party service providers that can really help you uh, problem solve and navigate those systems. Um, a key thing to remember is that the Canadian government can never enter into the commercial dispute on your behalf. We can't do that as a government. But we're really there to facilitate and to help and provide that on the ground insight and connection to help uh, resolve problems. And that's what we mean when we say commercial problem solving. Thank you, Christine. And uh, in the matter of time, um, and I know we're also all standing between you and your lunch, and that's always <laughs> a difficult position, especially after so much uh, food for thought. Um, so uh, quickly before we go into the room and see if there's any question for our speakers, I'd just like maybe if there's any last word of wisdom from any of you really experienced uh, uh, presenters today, um, I'd like to pass on to anyone who have a, a little key advice for, for everyone in the room today to use this. Doug. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I know, you know, I'm not revealing a name of a, co a company because this happened to a company from another country that I, I knew of that was doing business in Europe. And they had a number of contracts were doing really, really well, but they hadn't spent that much time in the market. And, I, you know, I, they told me the story about it. They said, you know, we never went back to that market a whole lot. We didn't nurture it. We thought we were doing great. And the economic downturn came. And every person we dealt with dropped us. And he said, I followed up years later to see what happened. And the feedback I got from everyone was, you were the easiest person to drop because I didn't know you. And it's probably why people break up on email. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, the, the whole thing about I guess, yeah, and, and, you know, and the person said, I didn't realize Europe was a relationship market. And the last bit of, if there's any bit of wisdom, every market's a relationship market. The relationships are different, but they're all relationship markets. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good point. Relationships. Anyone else as a, a key a takeaway for our crowd today? Or? No? Um, yes, please, Sanjeev. Yes, okay. Um, I just wanted to mention to the people in the, in the audience um, that this panel is very special for us. Uh, it was not supposed to be exactly like this, but there's a reason why we have all of these federal partners and provincial partners up here. Um, our chief trade commissioner for Canada, as I mentioned earlier, is a, is a woman named Dr. Ailish Campbell. And when Ailish was reviewing this, she's the head of the Trade Commissioner Service. So uh, when she was reviewing our plans for these roadshows, she said, I want to have the Canadian Commercial Corporation, I want EDC, BDC on stage together with all of the provincial partners and other federal partners that can assist exporters. So the, there's a reason why, Jonathan, the CCC, are, like EDC, BDC, they've got reps in all of the provinces, but the CCC is based out of Ottawa, and we've flown Jonathan down here, even though his particular um, service is, is very niche-oriented, but she thought it would be a great idea to have all of the uh, federal partners that can assist you with exporting together. So this is a very unusual panel. You're not going to see this. You probably haven't seen it before. Um, I know the CCC, I don't think you've been part of, of the panel before, but there's a reason why they're all here. Um, the other thing that she wanted also in every city in which we've done, thanks to the, the work in this particular province of NSBI, is we have identified a business champion. Uh, in this case, it's Osborne, but um, in, in every province has chosen their own business champion because, um, as they mentioned um, throughout these presentations, and Greg Houlihan from London said the same thing, that if you, if you want to do exporting, 
uh, to Europe, uh, the greatest advice you can get is from somebody who's already done it. And Osborne mentioned the wonderful cooperation that exists um, within uh, Nova Scotia, but we found that all across the Atlantic provinces. People are very willing to help you. They will tell you what they've done right, what they've done wrong. They will steer you in the right direction. Um, I can't believe when Osborne said that when you're at the booth at a trade show and all the Nova Scotians are side by side, the competitors, if he's not there and somebody comes looking for him, the others will take a message. Well, they don't do that for me. They send them to my competitors. So this is, um, <laughs> this is yeah, they, they're really happy when I take a break. But at any rate, uh, that's why this panel is here. So this was a direction of the Chief Trade Commissioner to have this this group like this so please take advantage of that and keep in mind that even though this is a panel all of these people are in the export cafe after so Jonathan will be there from the CCC they all have a booth in the in the in the room down the hall so if you have any specific questions you can see them there as well okay thanks but I, ha I had to mention that because I know the Chief Trade Commissioner is live streaming so I want to make sure <laughs> the boss knows about but we have 10 minutes now for any questions that would be uh, of a more general uh, nature. So by all means, if there is anyone here in the room who, uh, who has a burning question, we'd be happy to take the microphone around. I would over here. Okay, thanks. Hi there, thanks very much. Excellent presentation. Um, I was pleased to see the earlier um, focus on service, uh, trade and service providers. I'm wondering if presenters here could comment on special services that they have to help those who export services. So any, uh, any specific agency or department want to take a first crack at this question on services and how we can help companies in that sector given the opportunities in Europe? I, I, I can chat a little bit about that. We, uh, we, we don't have a specific focus necessarily on goods or services at, at NSBI. We, we try to help any company that, uh, that, that can, uh, can potentially export or that is exporting. So we have a, a group, actually a number in the room here, of, of export development executives that are sector agnostic and really focus on helping companies build capacities to export. So that's back to that self-assessment tool and back to the guided assessment. Um, at any point, they would be happy to sit down with, with a services company, go through their uh, their export plan or help them build an export plan and then, and then help walk them through the stages to be able to export more or into a new market or wherever it might be. We certainly are also always looking at different ways, uh, innovative solutions on how we can help companies get into market. Uh, I can give you an example. It's not a European example, but uh, it could potentially be a European example at some point. But we, we just over the last year developed something called the Scale-Up Hub in uh, Cambridge, and it's really on uh, focused on tech-enabled service-type companies uh, trying to scale them in the New England market. So we've hired a business development representative in that market. We've uh, leased some office space at WeWork, and, uh, and we have four companies now that are in the program working uh, with us for one year and trying to really help them scale in that market. And we're, that's something we're working with the other Atlantic provinces with, maybe looking at a European market uh, as a next step. So we're always looking for different types of uh, ways to work with, with companies not necessarily always on the trade mission uh, uh, route that, that we've, we've, we've done in the past. But I would say the message from NSBI's perspective is that we're open. We have a regional team across the province. There's eight of them. Um, they would be the first point of contact uh, and knock on the door, get in and start talking with, with us. And we've got a lot of different ser services and solutions for companies, whether it's goods or services. So, yeah. And I think that's probably true for everyone on this stage, uh, that as much as we do support companies that offer goods and export goods, we do the same for services. Uh, I know programs are also covering both. So uh, if you want to discuss in any more details this afternoon, please come and see us. I'd just like to uh, yes, follow please, up on, please, that, on please. that answer. So um, what, one of the challenges companies have if they're uh, in the service sector is uh, financing. Uh, we see that because there's in some cases not hard assets that, uh, that form as uh, a security or an asset base. Uh, so with a traditional lender, sometimes that becomes a challenge for those companies. And so, um, so BDC has developed a number of solutions that are, um, that are friendly towards uh, knowledge-based industries. And uh, so to your point about service, so 
particularly uh, as of 2018, actually, so quite hot, hot off the press. Uh, BDC has developed some uh, very specific technology-related uh, financing. Uh, some of those would be applicable for companies that are even pre-revenue, uh, and some of those would be for companies that are, uh, are actually uh, scaling up and have fairly significant uh, capital requirements to the point where um, this doesn't happen every day, so it's a little more on the exotic side, but, uh, but BDC's uh, venture arm will take, uh, for, under the right circumstance, will take an equity position in a company to help them uh, really get access to capital and scale up. So, and Taking advantage to mention that the BDC is doing a, a lot of work with uh, VC for women-owned companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been uh, seeing from, from up close, I know also Josie is in the room somewhere, our uh, businesswoman in international trade, program manager, and together we were in Toronto with uh, a lot of your BDC colleagues uh, at a WeConnect event a few months ago, and I was really impressed by the uh, the investment that's being done in women-owned companies, so uh, the, the, all the VC and whatnot. So uh, if any of uh, you are business entrepreneurs, uh, by all means, this is a, a good way to, uh, to access capital uh, with the BDC, who's been such a champion for women-owned companies, and, and I invite you to come see uh, uh, Josie this afternoon, if that's the case. Any other comments on the, f on the services side? No? So maybe we have time for one other question before we have lunch. So this one right here, just if you just w want to take maybe the, the microphone so people who are not in the room can understand the question. The last word is live streaming. Oh, yes. Uh, no, it's more of a comment. When I look up at the panel, excluding our friend on the left here, but we've used the service of, of all the other agencies here as an exporter and into the marketplace, whether it be you know, different financing programs to assist or assistance in the market, or even Doug pulling me out of the way of a, a car on a busy night in uh, Munich and <laughs> saved me from being run over. I don't well, know what damage would have been to the that's vehicle. That's troubleshooting. He's gone, he's gone for the full <laughs> length of it. Wife wasn't happy with she him. She hasn't but forgiven me. <laughs> <laughs> she says she hasn't forgiven him for that. But overall, and some of the comments that everybody's made, I, I can relate to and uh, or encourage anybody and everybody to do the same thing. And another resource, whether in the booth or a phone call away, is other exporters like ourselves yeah. for the Nova Scotian companies or for anybody is helping them, whether it's prior to the show, at the show, assisting each other. It's amazing how much business has been done between Nova Scotia companies in the booth with each other that in some cases we don't get to meet up with each other until we're at the trade show. <laughs> and we have actually done hundreds of thousands of dollars of sales amongst companies or finding out that a particular company offers a service that somebody else can use that they weren't aware of. So sometimes we miss that perspective of it, but that does happen and happens significantly more, than, more all the time. And, and just the ability to get into it. When you go into Brussels, I mean, you walk in the hall, it's the big Canada sign, and you get the prime locations. You could never afford to do that on your own. So, you know, a few thousand bucks to contribute towards the cost of booths versus $100,000 US if you want to do it on your own. So the services are there, and I encourage anybody to take advantage of it. Thank and thanks. That means so much more coming from someone who's experienced it than us who is just trying to look good and, <laughs> and then say all the things that we do and we hope to do for your company. So thanks for, for, for sharing your, your experience. Um, so we do have three minutes left. So if there's any burning questions, we can take one more. I know I said it was the last one, but uh, we do have time for one more question. If there's anyone, no? Okay, so then I would like all of you to join me in thanking this wonderful panel. <laughs> great job. And uh, to all come and see us this afternoon. Okay, thanks. So, ladies and gentlemen, time for lunch. There's a buffet lunch that's being served in the foyer right behind us. Um, I would ask that you take a few minutes to stretch your legs and for any needed fluid adjustments. For those of you who uh, uh, want to check your Wi-Fi, your, your BlackBerry, no, your BlackBerry, whatever, your, your mobile device, 
Um, the Wi-Fi code, and I neglected to give you this this morning, is January 2018, capital J, all one word. Um, please get your lunch and bring it back here to the room by 12.50, that's 20 minutes from now, when we will be able to welcome our keynote speaker, His Excellency Petrus Ustubs, who's actually here with us already in the room. He's the ambassador of the European Union to Canada. And for those of you who have a few minutes uh, while you're not networking at your tables, if you could have a look at the survey, it's very important to us to get that feedback and to know how we can continue to help you after you've heard everything that you've heard today. So I'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you.